Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. Audience members, I want to start by asking you to please silence your electronic devices. I would also like to remind people that in addition to everybody who's in the room today, we also have people watching and listening online. So please consider your language and comments and testimony today. Today's meeting is a hybrid board meeting. Some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those presenting virtually, please mute your mic when not speaking. When presenting, make sure to unmute your mic and turn on your camera. For all presenters, please state your name for the record before speaking and responding to questions. May I have a motion on the consent calendar? Commissioner uh, Myron moves, Commissioner Brim Edward seconds, approval of the consent calendar. Uh, Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jaipal? Aye. Commissioner Brim Edwards? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Uh, I also am an aye. <laughs> Chair Vega Peterson. Aye. <laughs> the consent calendar is approved. Opportunity for public comment on non-agenda matters. This is a time for the board to hear public testimony, not for board deliberation. When it's your turn to speak, I will call your name and unmute you or call you to the presenter's table. I will set a timer for two minutes when you begin speaking and announce when your time is up, at which point, please wrap up your sentences. Um, we have received 34 verbal testimony and six written testimony, which was stared, shared with board members and staff. We're gonna start with virtual testimony. Um, and first up, we have um, Alyssa Walker-Keller. Alyssa, you can um, unmute yourself and begin. Good morning, commissioners, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning, and thank you for letting me have a moment to share with you. My name is Alyssa Walker-Keller. I am the Asylum Seeker Support Coordinator for the Interfaith Movement for Immigrant Justice, Emerge. I wish to thank you all, and particular Commissioner Jayapal, for her diligence in supporting the asylum seeking and recently arrived community. And thank you for your work in the See No Stranger program. I also wish to encourage you to continue your investment in providing shelter to this new community of Oregonians through the unanticipated revenue. As Emerge works with Oregon's newest residents, we're finding that many of the families we work with who have arrived this past year come from places that do not have a significant presence in Oregon. When they arrive here, it's either because they were sent to pursue their immigration status in the city by the government, or because they have someone they're trying to reunify with. Unfortunately, many of the people they are reunifying with have only arrived in the last few months themselves and are also unstably housed which means we are in a situation where there's nowhere for someone to land in their first few days here. The result is situations like last week when we were scrambling for a place for a family of six to stay and then received news that at 10.30 p.m. another family had just arrived and was turned away at a safe rest village. They had nowhere to go with their preschool-aged children and slept outside the welcome center on the street because there was no room for them anywhere. We also received a family last night in the exact same situation. They've all been since navigated by a wonderful partner in the housing navigation system at Path Home, but they are still many months from being placed in a shelter for families. We have been able to find temporary housing and really the reality is there are just so many similarly situated individuals in this moment. In the absence of an infrastructure, people who have suffered deep trauma and displacement are being left without clarity on how to meet their basic needs. This is a moment that's going to require all of our investment, yours and ours and the state's, and we're so glad for the coordination that's happening. We're asking our congregations to find um, places to host potentially, Fine. but my ask is that you would just continue, continue investing funding and continue to educate your case makers in mainstream shelters and to support people who are, in, support the efforts to make long-term stable housing available. I'm Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Beth Skinner. Beth, you can begin. Hi. Uh, my name is Beth Skinner. I live in the Lentz community. I'm here because over the last several years, I've had a front row seat to the arrival experience of asylum seekers and refugees, and their experiences have been both beautiful and heartbreaking. Beautiful because of the bravery it took for them to get here, and heartbreaking to watch them struggle to get what they need to survive and be safe when they are here. 
With the limited funds they are provided, they must feed, clothe, and house their family on day one. The housing they find is often inadequate and expensive, and sometimes it isn't found at all. Without the generosity of others, they end up sleeping outside, oftentimes with small children. My family has had the privilege of owning a rental unit on our property that we offer as emergency housing when we can. Um, we housed a beautiful family of six for several days this last week and formed a deep connection with them. We listened to their story of traveling for two months by boat and on foot with small children through, cent through South America, Central America, and finally arriving here. And they've been bounced around from temporary house to temporary house um, and felt that the housing was unsafe for their children and not adequate, very small and expensive. So, excuse me, when we finally found them other temporary housing for several weeks, they still were left not knowing where they would live next. Their children can't go to school because they don't know where they're going to live. And it's often very complicated to transport them there. And um, meanwhile, they're traveling with all their belongings, which aren't very much, but it's a lot to carry. Um, I just want to advocate for those families that what they're receiving isn't adequate to even just function on a normal basis and get started while they wait for employment and permanent housing, which they often can't get right away without cosigns, without greater funds for first last month rent. Um, Time. That's all, I guess. <laughs> Thanks so much for hearing me. And next, we're going to move to in-person testimony. I'll call people up four at a time. Please come and sit at the wood table up here. Um, first, we have Robert P., Richard Perkins, Tony Vizina, and Will Mahan. Good morning. You can go ahead and begin as soon as you're ready. Robert, you're up first. Thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Timothy P. I'm a master's level certified addiction counselor in Oregon, and I've worked in the field of addiction and mental health for over 37 years. I'm also a person in long-term recovery from addiction and mental health challenges. I'm requesting the commissioners to direct funds into detox, treatment, and recovery housing. This continuum of services saved my life, and I have witnessed countless examples of the miracle of recovery in my patients when the right services are available when needed. Sadly, throughout my entire career, particularly in the public sector, essential services have been lacking. Front-end services such as medical detox have been extremely limited, and for those able to access detox, continuum of care has been anything but guaranteed despite overwhelming evidence that detox as a standalone intervention is largely ineffective over time. I was excited to hear of a new 16-bed program opening, but my first questions upon learning of this new resource were, what mechanisms have been put in place to guarantee the availability of warm handoff for continued treatment? Have relationships been established with existing sober housing providers in an effort to move people off the street into a sober community? As we focus our attention on investments in recovery, I believe it may be time to examine current models. I've been a champion of residential treatment, but throughout my career, there's been a severe shortage of available beds, and reimbursement models have not covered costs. Programs currently cannot retain staffing levels necessary for quality service delivery. The private sector has all but divested itself. I believe there are opportunities to preserve the benefits of residential rehabilitation while reducing costs associated with brick and mortar facilities. Partial hospitalization combined with quality sober housing and coordinated mentor services, I believe, can fill the intensity gap we currently experience. I've heard idealists throughout my career say, it's not all about the money. I couldn't, dis I couldn't disagree more. It is about the money. It's a precious resource that there never seems to be enough of. Please bring your brightest and most creative and passionate minds together to find ways to serve as many deserving people as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Great time. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. I had a hard time following that. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Dick Perkins, and I'm asking for more treatment resources in Multnomah County. The county has three major sources of funds to access for the much needed services of sobering detox and post detox recovery. Those are Measure 110 funds generated from marijuana taxes, SHS 
SHS funds from taxes on high income households and high revenue businesses and Medicaid funds granted to Oregon under waivers from the federal government that will fund short term housing along with behavioral health. The first detox facility funded by 110 funds just opened in southeast Portland with the help of Clackamas County. Why would Clackamas County fund detox in Multnomah County? Why has Multnomah County not used 110 funds for much needed sobering and detox? SHS funds are di distributed pro rata by Metro based on the tax each county generates. As the wealthier households and high income businesses flee Portland for places like Lake of Oswego, Multnomah County's SHS coffers will decline as Clackamas counties grow. But where do you think they're sending their homeless in need of treatment? Let's start accessing all of these funding sources to end addiction to fentanyl and meth and start those who are homeless on a path to stable housing. Fund Bybee Lakes and Crown Plaza and detox and sobering with SHS funds. Please, Commissioners Jayapal and Stegman. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Will Mahan. Uh, my father, William Mahan Sr., he worked for the city of Portland for 36 years in facilities maintenance as a supervisor retiring in 82. He was deeply concerned about the homeless situation in Portland and always talked about the homeless struggling with alcohol, drug and alcohol addictions clear back in the 80s. I believe that is that hearing my father talk about the homeless situations is where I received my passion for recovery work and started blessings from above and became an elder in criminal. I have assisted over 19 of my clients in the last 200 day, 210 days off fentanyl and into treatment services. Um, most of my uh, clients are struggling with housing. Uh, most went to detox, then inpatient and outpatient, and now are on medically assisted medications to stop their cravings of opiates. Most of the clients are having problems in recovery housing. Once they complete and successfully graduate the program, it becomes extremely difficult to find funded recovery housing. Most of my clients have lost everything in their lives, mostly some of their families, some of their jobs, and some still struggle with mental health issues and by no means have any financial support until they can get on their feet and on the correct path in life. There are a lot of state uh, supported services for people under state correctional jurisdiction. However, there is virtually no programs for people under federal correctional jurisdiction for recovery housing in Portland. There needs to be more funds available for recovery housing along with said programs for people struggling with mental health disorders. The, uh, the time for detox in Oregon needs to be extended to 30 days if necessary. The people deemed either uh, to inpatient or outpatient based on their criteria and needs based on a case by case basis. People make mistakes, but we are not a mistake. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Um, you know, first I just want to say thank you guys so much uh, for taking time to consider this issue. Um, my name's Tony, I'm a person in long-term recovery. I've talked with most of you guys over the years. Uh, you know, I'm here to, s to support investments in detox, uh, stabilization, recovery housing. If you're here today with me, I brought some friends. Can you stand up if you're in support of that too? Okay, I'd like, I'd like you guys to stay standing. The, the other thing that I want to say is that I want to commend the commissioners for taking this opportunity to look at where you can make more investments into treatment despite the um, kind of problem around Measure 110 that I see where uh, there's a kind of a passing off the responsibility to Measure 110 funding, which is kind of narrowing the scope of the problem from a funding perspective, but you guys didn't do that. You didn't say Measure 110 is dealing with that problem you guys are stepping up and considering more ways to fund treatment. And so everybody who's standing, could you give our commissioners a round of applause for that? <laughs> so I, I, you guys can sit down now. Um, so I, I've already sent you a detailed, um, a detailed uh, letter about how I think you should spend the money. But what I would continue to ask you, you to do is use your voice, um, use the, resources that you have at your discretion to continue to s expand access 
to addiction treatment services, and then any sort of government relations resources you may have personally or within your offices, please use those to continue to pressure our uh, state legislature to continue making investments in treatment services and do not allow them to say Measure 110 is funding that. Thank you. Thank you. I will just um, have a note, note before we move. Um, so the applause was great, but normally in the board meeting, if you want to um, you know, show appreciation, approval, we'll do that. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Next up, we have DJ Guild, Heather Palmquist, Amanda Escrow, and Devin Andre. Good morning. You can begin. Go, go DJ, ahead. DJ, you're up first. Go ahead. Hit the, here. Yeah. Thank, let me get my glasses, please. Thank you for listening to our testimony today. Also, thank you to the commission uh, for supporting Bybee Lakes. That was a great decision. Would you mind stating your name for the record, please? Uh, DJ Guild. Um, also, like to thank uh, the good doctor, Commissioner Myron. Uh, you're the only one I've heard talk about accountability. Uh, so thank you for that. I know the uh, citizens appreciate that. I'm a product of treatment. Uh, as a direct result, I have a life. I'm a payer into the system and not a draw on the system. Evidence-based treatment works and has efficacy. We're housing people uh, is a time-tested model that does not work, regardless of how it is packaged. In New York, Chicago, it's called the projects. Changing the geography to Portland and, and the name of affordable housing will not change the outcome. This is an, this is an expensive burden on the taxpayer. At over $400,000 a door to build this stuff, it's, it's a big burden. You're creating an industrial complex uh, along the way. The Housing First model is enabling while detox treatment and sober living workforce development are empowering. When I drive by these homeless camps, I feel empathy for, uh, from a personal perspective as a capitalist. Um, and then I, uh, I feel uh, a measure of how much wasted talent is in these homeless camps and productivity that's lost and what can be harnessed to invigorate our society. Uh, when the taxpayer vote for taxes and measures to fund all, all to alleviate the livability issues that are pl plaguing them, um, predominantly untreated addiction and mental health, which manifests and displays as homelessness and crime, uh, the taxpayer is making a trade-off. Uh, so we take the money out of our pocket and give it to you with the hope and trust that was given uh, with the campaign promises and exclamations of change, uh, and that hasn't happened. So thank you thank for listening. You. Thank you. Yep. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Ireland Esquivel, and uh, I'm a person in long-term recovery, which for me means I haven't used a substance in over seven years. Uh, currently, I sit in, um, uh, in a role as the executive director of True Colors Recovery, which is an organization that provides free mentoring services and recovery services to the LGBTQIA2S plus community. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to go ahead and say thank you so much for, uh, for showing up today and the leadership roles that you do go ahead and hold. I know that being a leader in the community is very hard and you all do it very graciously. Um, investing into detox is highly important for the LGBTQ plus community. Our community members have one of the highest rates of substance use and often enter into treatment with the highest severity of use. We have been lied to and told that connection to community and personal acceptance uh, can only be found in places like bars. The high rates of alcohol consumption is normal and the only way to feel comfortable as who we are is through the use of substances. We ask that you fund detoxes and, uh, detoxes and recovery housing to, uh, to expand the local capacity and give local organizations the opportunity to invest into their programs to create responsive and diverse services. We want the opportunity to be understood and feel safe when accessing services, and we want the opportunity to create a sober foundation and connection with others who have chosen a pathway of recovery. Creating the opportunity for people to live in housing where they are not triggered on a daily basis and can lean on other sober people to support them is a critical component in gaining long-term recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Thank you very much for showing up. Uh, my name is Heather Palmquist. 
I'm currently in treatment at Volunteers of America. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm requesting that the commissioners direct funds to detox, treatment, and recovery housing. These make a huge impact for getting myself and others to the first goal of changing my life and others' lives. As a person who's actively utilizing these services, knowing that transitional housing is available to me when I graduate treatment, that helps me make a brighter future for me and my family. We need more funds to support transitional and sober housing for people like me who are working to change our lives. Thank you so much for showing up. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Morning, my name is Devin Andrade. Uh, thank you for taking the time to, to listen to all of us today. Uh, I have been in long-term recovery for over a decade. Uh, I own and operate sober livings and have been for 10 years and involved in the recovery community for 13. I work with many organizations and seen many get on wait lists, apply for funding, just to not get accepted or continue to wait while their situation gets worse, while individuals suffer and impact uh, the community in a long-term way. Decriminalization of drugs in the community without enough funding for detox, treatment, <clears throat> and housing has been unfortunate. It seems like the, the cart was in front of the horse. It would be an amazing uh, for more funding to be applied towards detox, treatment, and sober living. I have seen the, the county and the city recognize uh, a homeless and drug crisis um, without the, the, the funding to be able to accommodate. I have applied towards uh, the, the homeless tax, um, which uh, that model of doing massive expensive buildings or burning bridges with unexperienced apartment uh, landlords uh, that don't have the, the understandings and network and community to work with detox treatments, mentor programs, uh, all of the community partners that I currently work with uh, really uh, is spending money in an inexperienced way that could be put to better use. Thank you for your time today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Desiree Eden Ocampo, who's virtual. Um, Desiree, you can unmute yourself and begin. Oh. I can you I can see you, but oh there you go. Okay. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Thank you. Good morning. Um, um good morning, County Commissioners. My name is Desiree Irena Campo. I use she her pronouns. I'm the executive director of Rahab Sisters, an organization who for two decades now, have been building community through radical hospitality with trans and cis women, non-binary, gender diverse people, and trans men who are marginalized by poverty, houselessness, sex work, violence, and substance use in East Portland and along the 82nd Avenue and I-205 corridor. I am here today to speak on three things related to Chair Vega Peterson's proposed investments for the FY 2023 unanticipated supportive housing services revenue and balance of FY 2024 for American Rescue Plan funds. First, I commend the chair and her team for this comprehensive proposal, reflecting input, conversations, and priorities brought forth by many stakeholders, other commissioners, and from communities across the, the county. And thank you to each of the commissioners for working to bring cohesion to a plan to effectively address the crisis we all collectively experience. And second, I want to underscore the need for a system overhaul. While this plan can certainly provide significant momentum for increasing the efficiency of our current systems, this plan can just as easily backfire on itself without real results that we all desire. When systems to place people into housing, whether permanent or transitional or temporary, are closed and difficult to navigate by organizations such as Rahab Sisters, um, who have folks eager to be placed um, but wait to no avail, then people who are in the margins continue to be left out. If there is no plan to overhaul fragmented and siloed systems that incentivizes and forces direct service organizations to compete for dollars in order to provide critical services, then we would only waste $60 million here. If service providers are to make use of these Hi. dollars immediately, we also need a change to the reimbursement model, take the burden off service providers to front the up. money and reduce the red tape. Oh. I'm sorry, was that time? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Adrian Burris, Melly Rose, Gretchen Anderson, and Michael Nichols. 
Good morning. You can begin. I can begin? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, sorry, I was like adding some stuff to my, so you guys can call me at the, the right ready? time. You ready? Go. Um, but my name is Adrian Burris. I'm a person in long term recovery. For me, that means I haven't drank or used any mind altering substances in over seven years. Um, I'm currently the director of operations at the Fourth Dimension Recovery Center, a recovery community organization dedicated to providing peer delivered services to young people in the Portland metro area. And I also serve as the chair of the ADPC's recovery subcommittee. I want to start by saying that while recovery support services are an integral part of sustaining recovery, the services that help people get into recovery are equally as important. My road to recovery didn't just start with inpatient treatment, it actually started with jail. I had to have time away from my substance of choice to give me perspective, provide me with clarity, and I 100% believe that without that, my decision making when I finally did land in inpatient treatment could have been much different. Not to mention I was homeless at the time of my incarceration. When I finally got to treatment, I felt ready, and I truly believed that my time away from my substance of choice, forced or not, gave me stability and helped me maximize my treatment experience. I then went on from residential to become a recipient of services, peer services at the Fourth Dimension Recovery Center, which also was an integral, integral part of my recovery journey. I said all that to say this, all recovery support services play an important role in the lives of those struggling with substance use disorder, but the catalyst to change often involves time away from substances, preferably in a safe, therapeutic, recovery conducive environment. That's why I request that the commission make investments in detox and recovery housing, services that undoubtedly open the doors to recovery for thousands of people. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, commissioners, for allowing me to speak. My name is Michael Nicholas, and I'm the senior certification specialist for the Mental Health and Addiction Certification Board of Oregon. And one of my job duties is to certify a recovery housing using National Alliance for Recovery Residents National Standards. MACBO is a local chapter of NAR that accredits recovery housing in the state of Oregon. And currently there are about 160 NAR accredited recovery homes in the Tri-Counties. We are asking that Multnomah County should direct a portion of the $65 million in excess uh, in excess funding to recovery housing. The current distribution of funds favors large providers of housing, first SROs and new construction. The current process is very difficult for smaller re uh, providers of recovery housing to access. Recovery housing is incredibly less expensive than uh, new construction. It is an economical solution to support recovery housing from addiction and, and directly address the county's addiction issues. For a single new construction SRO can cost between two hundred and four hundred thousand dollars, whereas recovery housing can cost between five hundred and sixty-four dollars a month to seven hundred and nine dollars a month. Moreover, HUD has released guidance stating that communities need both housing first and recovery housing that support ongoing recovery. Little to no money has been invested into recovery housing. Nearly all, if not all, of the funding has gone to housing first. The White House Office of National Drug Control Policy had, has issued model statutory language to assist states in funding the NAR accredited recovery homes. I would also like to add that recovery housing will be added to the American or to the ASAM criteria for substance use disorder diagnosis. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Hi, good morning. My name is Gretchen Anderson. I'm a person in long term recovery. Um, I work for Fourth Dimension Recovery as a supervisor for an outreach team that uh, tries to get homeless people off the streets and get people into treatment. Um, it's, I feel like uh, when I was young, my grandma used to say a stitch in time saves nine and I did not understand what that meant. Mm -hmm. But now I for sure understand what that means and it's like a run in the pantyhose and you just can't, it just keeps going and going, you know, and, and, and I know we're putting band-aids on stuff um, and I just, the infrastructure was not in place to begin with, which is one of the problems. Um, but I, I, I sincerely believe that we can still make a, a significant difference in the lives of our community by putting the money toward um, housing, so sober housing, detox, and treatment. Um, 
especially stabilization houses, which is a new thing that they've done to bridge the gap between, um, let's say you go to detox and then there's not, or actually trying to get into sober living when you're not sober. Um, you know, or you can go to detox for a few days and then you get back out before you can get into treatment. What's going to happen? You're homeless. You're going to go back in the streets and you're going to get back on drugs. Um, there's been major overdoses lately uh, where I work. And so many of the people have been like, yes, please get me into detox. Please, I'm willing to go because my friend has just passed away. Um, and I'm calling and I'm calling and I can't get people in. Uh, and they're, when the windows open, that's when you got to get in because the willingness is very short. And like Adrian, I had to go to jail to stop me back in the day. We didn't have these resources. Um, so I would really like to request that the money goes to these uh, treatment detox and um, sober living. Um, people are definitely willing to go. And um, I feel like I'm trying to mop up a lake with a mop and just bring it out. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning. My name is Melly Rose. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. Um, I am the Director of Operations for Iron Tribe Network. Um, we provide recovery housing for families and peer support. Um, I come here today asking that some of the funds be directed to recovery housing, detox, and treatment. Um, from operating these homes for well over 10 years, one of the things that we see is People need a little time to get on their feet. They may not have the funds, and there's been a little bit of money that's sent to recovery housing, but it's just not enough. Um, housing First has so many dollars, and recovery housing is part of the continuum. If people can't, they need to go to treatment, then recovery housing, then their own place where Housing First is funded. Without, without going to treatment or without having a little time in recovery housing, people are more likely to fail in their own apartment. Um, <clears throat> housing is the greatest need, um, but I believe that the perfect recipe for someone is when they're ready, that treatment's available. You know, a lot of times it's not, and they're waiting, and they're having to stick around, and thankfully, we have a lot of peers out there trying to keep them engaged till they can get into treatment, but it's a lot of work. Um, the amount of success I believe that we would have with the homeless population um, that are ready to be sober if we had access to immediate treatment would be enormous. So, but there's just not enough funding. You know, I just need more funding. And so if there's available funding that we can funnel into these services, I think that we would get a lot of return. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Cody Roberts, Elizabeth Smith, Ellie Staw, and Charles Bridgecrane Johnson. Good morning, go ahead. Good morning, um, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Cody Roberts. I'm the Director of Services at 4D Recovery. I've been clean and sober for a little over 10 years and I've been working in the field for eight years. I was lucky and went to jail uh, when I came to recovery. Um, during that time I was able to dry out um, and then I went to treatment at VOA. Um, I discovered, I, I discovered long-term support while I was in VOA that set me up for uh, long-term success. So many of our clients at 4D wait to go to detox or go to detox and then are released without a good plan in place. Treatment options are limited and the treatment that is available is either full or they have wait list. This window of opportunity is very small when people want to get into recovery and address their substance use. We would love to have some more options and quicker access to treatment. When we are not able to provide an option to people, or they have to wait to get into treatment, some die. My request is that the county invest in services that ensure people are set up to succeed. The county saved my life, treatment saved my life, jail saved my life. I was able to get into treatment and I was lucky. Um, let's provide the same opportunity to the still suffering. You have the power to save many lives. It's just a flick of your pen. Please help us. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, commissioners, for allowing us to be here and hearing our voices today. My name is Elizabeth Smith. I work for Oxford House in Oregon. I am a training and education coordinator, and I am outreach services for Multnomah County and Deschutes County. 
Oxford House is a nationwide peer-based financially self-supporting recovery housing model. We currently have 217 houses throughout Oregon. I am also a board member for Oregon Moms for Addiction Recovery, trying to affect change as to how we approach addiction treatment in Oregon. I am a person in long-term recovery. I have been in recovery since March 8, 2010. When I finally made it to recovery, I had just survived my eighth overdose. And when I was released from the hospital, I was given a list of treatment centers. There was no warm handoff. There no, was no access to treatment, no mentor meeting with me, anything like that. I was denied detox because of the combination of medications that I was on and drugs I was taking. I then proceeded to wait two and a half months, two and a half months on the streets still, staying wherever I could with family, friends, wherever, until I was able to be accepted into DePaul Treatment Center. This was over 13 years ago, and after having survived eight overdoses, not even using fentanyl, just using heroin at that time, I am so, so lucky to be able to be here today to speak to you. Our children are dying out there. We need to do something to affect change. Thank you for hearing us today. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, commissioners. My name is Ellie Stoss, and I am the recovery health director with the Fourth Dimension Recovery Center and a person in recovery for the last three and a half years. Within the last month of my addiction, I was in and out of every hospital in the Portland area due to drugs and alcohol, as well as certain circumstances that were beyond my control. This happened to me one to twice a day, depending on the circumstance. Uh, while in the hospital, all I wanted was to go to detox or treatment. Continuously, I was told there were no beds available. It wasn't until my family intervened that I was able to get into detox while nearly on my last breath. While in detox, I did everything within my power to go into long-term treatment or recovery housing to no avail. Reluctantly, my parents allowed me to come home one last time, but I was one of the lucky ones. Three and a half years later, we are still seeing the same struggle amongst the community we serve. They continue to reach out for help they need when they are ready and willing and told it is not there. The last drug they take is often not the last drug because they have not made it into detox treatment or housing, but because the last drug is the one that took their lives. I'm asking on behalf of the community I serve and I'm a part of that this funding be placed where it belongs into the detox treatment and housing that we so desperately need. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Charles Simka Bridge Crane Johnson and uh, I'm a little neurodivergent and there's some capacity issues. So I have to ask you to do the things that I really can't do myself. Um, I wish I had my shit together enough to bring some flashcards about the number of people that have died by overdose and how much it goes up each week or month. And then we could link that to the idea of fiduciary responsibility. When we misspend money, we kill people. Uh, this isn't theoretical because we have the body counts. Uh, when we walk over to transition projects now, you can see that instead of one pickup truck for the medical examiners, there's two new Ford vehicles. Um, they're not there just to be parked. They're there because people are dying. Um, and then, you've, you know, there's a lot of effective voices telling us what we need to do with the money we have. We also need to build a bipartisan effort, even though here in Oregon we only have one, I think, congressional delegate who's a Republican. This is the Federal Addiction Recovery Month, and even if we spent all our overspend, we wouldn't really be addressing the scope of the problem. So we need to build systems that let us know how many people we think are struggling with which types of addiction, how far behind are we in funding enough medicated assisted treatment slots to meet the needs of people who are struggling with fentanyl or still being old school with heroin or whatever their issue is. Uh, when we talk about Measure 110 and robbing Peter to pay Paul, we now rob Mary Jane to deal with more serious addictions. So we can also look at increasing funding from just the basic liquor taxes. 
uh, liquor and cigarette taxes can also be reviewed to see how we will build the funding going through Measure 110 and other places to meet the scope of the problem that is killing us. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ronald Ross, McLaurel Kapla, Solara Sa Sakazar, and Joan Agola. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, you can go ahead and begin. Thank you. Good morning, County Commissioners. My name is Ronald Ross. I'm a person in long-term recovery, just celebrating seven years. Um, I'm the East County Supervisor for Outreach for Fourth Dimension Recovery Center. We're old school boots on the ground, street level outreach, identifying high traffic areas, desired communities, and houseless encampments. Um, we intervene with hygiene kits, food, recovery resources, and conduct housing assessments. Additionally, we provide referrals to a plethora of community partners and shelters to help people find a safe refuge from houselessness. We need more dollars for shelter beds, detox, and treatment. As I'm performing outreach, I am unable to get clients into detox. Then when they do get into detox, the duration is short and they often are back on the streets. I'm requesting that the commissioners expand access to detox and treatment so that clients can have more time in detox before transitioning to the streets. This is something that I'm seeing every day in the communities that I serve. We need to normalize recovery instead of normalizing overdose. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Solara Salazar, co-founder and executive director of Cielo Treatment Center and West Coast Sober Housing. Thank you commissioners and Chair Vega Peterson for welcoming us today. Our agencies receive 300 to 450 calls or emails per month from individuals living on the streets or in their cars, desperately seeking recovery housing. Unfortunately, due to a lack of funding, we are unable to help. Our agency has an 86 bed capacity, but we can barely afford to keep our doors open. We are ready and willing to help address the homeless crisis. I'm here to humbly request that you earmark a meaningful portion of this funding to help houseless people in their quest for safe, sober, and supportive housing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the fourth name was Michael Kapla. I don't know what I said, but it was Michael Kapla. Thanks, Tasha. All right. Good morning. Should I go ahead? Yeah, please do. My name is Joan Ayala, and I provide um, uh, dual diagnosis assessment and uh, assessments for people facing criminal charges in all, most of the major counties in, in the state of Oregon. And um, my reports are used primarily by defense attorneys to mitigate the cases. I recommend level of care and supportive services, and I, my reports have become well known in the community. Um, I'd like to ask you to look at this from a public safety issue. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say. I just want to say that what I see in the criminal justice system, I have a very bird's eye view of what the needs are. And it's one thing to refer somebody who has addiction and criminality into treatment. We can usually find a place for them over time. But my concern is for people who have severe and persistent mental illness mixed with their substance abuse and homelessness. There's literally no place to send them. I have people that, uh, I say I have, but these are people that I work with um, that sit in jail because there's no, there's so few uh, dual di truly dual diagnosis treatment centers that are, that are able to deal with people who are experiencing psychosis and delusions. Um, I would just like to remind this council that when services are denied, these people go out, we talk about people sleeping in their cars. They're not really their cars usually, they're our cars that they've taken from us. I mean, <laughs> uh, my car was stolen two years ago and over the course of the whole time, between renting a car, getting my car fixed, paying towing fees, and getting it repaired, and never getting it back in the same shape that I had it in. It cost me over $15,000. I took a loan out to pay for that, and I'm still paying for it. I just wanna say that when we don't have services, the people go back out on the street, they're supporting themselves through criminality, they end up back in the CJS system. Thank we you. need to do something, thank, thank you. you. Uh, <clears throat> 
Good morning. Uh, good, good morning. Uh, hello, commissioners. My name is uh, Michael Kaplan. I've got a master's in educational psychology. I'm currently retired, but I worked with individuals with persistent mental illness and co-occurring alcohol and drug disorders since 1988, soon after I got sober on January 8, 1988. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak with you today about what may assist individuals with substance use disorders, especially homeless individuals and or those with persistent mental illness. Programs intended for any part of this population just outlined must be guided by knowledge of the newest perils of methamphetamine and or opioid use. Sadly, both drugs are often mixed, let alone in combination with still other drugs. For example, an expanded detox system must take into account the often more problematic behaviors correlated with newer drugs of abuse and staffed accordingly. Case management must be a priority here, as well as in the provision of treatment and or housing. Said case management should be available in some fashion 24-7. Housing options should follow a continuum of wet, dry, and various sober living models. All housing options require case management to be effective. Housing First advocates Advocates need only look at the ruin of the $28 million, million, $28 million low income apartment development in the Burry Building in Hazelwood, in a subject of a major article in Willamette Week. Wet housing may include outdoor camps, similar, similar to the recently opened camp in southeast Portland, and or some tiny house models, as well as emergency shelters. Dry housing may include some tiny house safe rest villages. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Next we have Gerard Murray, Robert Sanders, Tony Morse, and Christy Delahanty. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Vega Peterson, um, Chair Commissioners Myron, Jaya Paul, Brim Edwards, and Stegman. Um, my name is Tony Morris, and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director for Oregon Recovers. I'm also a person in long term recovery, which for me means I've not had a drink in over six and a half years. Um, I do want to acknowledge that September is National Recovery Month, and in that regard, share some statistics about Oregon's addiction crisis. Oregon ranks second in terms of addiction rates nationwide. We rank fifth in terms of alcohol use disorder. Excessive alcohol use is Oregon's third leading cause of preventable death and cost the state $4.8 billion in 2019. Oregonians die at a rate of six per day when we're talking about alcohol-related deaths and overdoses claim another three. In terms of where we are performing, in terms of supportive recovery housing, um, the OHSU gap analysis completed in 2022 tells us that we're falling 55% short. Speaking personally, I want to um, let everyone know that in January of 2017, I came to a very sharp and abrupt fork in the road. One of those paths had a future and the other did not. I have the honor of sitting at the dais and addressing you today because somebody in this room answered my call when I was pleading for help. Oregon and Portland in particular has a small and tight recovery community and we look out for one another. When I asked this person what I could do to repay her, she told me nothing but make sure you pay it forward and that's why I'm here today. It is essential that we begin as a community to invest more in supportive recovery housing so people trying to recover from addiction can have a safe place to recover without the triggering environment of people using and drinking around them. I want to acknowledge that I come from a place of privilege and recovery has been hard work, but um, I have been extraordinarily fortunate in terms of the resources that have been available to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tony. Uh, my name is, uh, thank you to the commissioners. Uh, my name is Robert Sanders. I'm grateful to be here today. Um, I want to say thank you for, for today's proclamation. Um, you know, I am a person with substance use disorder, 
And, and if we continue to live in stigma about accessing resources, uh, we're not gonna make our state any better. Currently we're 50% under uh, capacity for what we need. Uh, I come here today though to, though to speak about adolescent services. Uh, I work at 40 Recovery as the Director of Adolescent Services. Right now we currently serve 26 clients. Uh, we're doing some really good work. Uh, in the last two months since opening, uh, we've seen 65% of our clients improve their family relations. Uh, we've seen those 26, 26 clients average uh, 25 days of sobriety time. The issue is, is that there's another 35% uh, that are unable to access any detox or residential treatment within the state, and I need your guys' help. I am really tired of, of having to talk to parents and these kids and saying there's just no beds available. And so that's the reality that I face when they come into my office every day. Um, but I, I really do appreciate this step and the start of the conversation about what we need, um, and I appreciate all the work that you do every day, so thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Go ahead. Commissioners, I want to thank you for your time in declaring September Recovery Month. I'm Jared Murray, the Executive Director of Painted Horse Recovery. I've been abstinent from alcohol and drugs for over 10 years. Painted Horse Recovery provides peer services in Monoma County and has been able to support many Native Americans in recovery. Painted Horse Recovery has formed an outreach and intervention program that goes into the community and works with and engages houseless Native Americans struggling with drug and alcohol addiction. The team brings essential clothing, food, first aid supplies, Narcan, and traditional medicines such as sage, cedar, and tobacco. Our team has had a success in engaging them into our program because of the traditional medicines and also the other things that we offer. We've had some people go into detox and treatment and worked with them after treatment to sustain recovery. The system needs more access to treatment for our people. Um, excuse me. Uh, I came from a deep, dark addiction that controlled my life. I used to live and lived to use. I would have moments of clarity when I was in jail for short periods of time. I knew I wanted something different. I just didn't know how. The last time I was arrested, I was offered treatment. I was resistant at first to go to treatment like most addicts are, but I believe that that jail stint and treatment saved my life. <clears throat> if it was not for going to jail to dry out and treatment, I would not be where I'm at today. I was able to get into Oxford housing and have a safe place to live. I lived in Oxford housing for five years. The Oxford House helped me develop a foundation for my recovery while living, clean and so while living in clean and sober housing. I was able to get a degree from PCC and get more involved in my culture. I'm asking that you use the additional SHS funds to invest into detox treatment and recovery housing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Crystal Delahanty. I'm the founder and executive director of PDX Saints Love. I am also a person in long-term recovery. We are community health workers and peer support focused on addressing social determinants of health in East Portland. Our goals are to address food insecurity, navigating complex housing systems, access to substance use recovery, and other health care systems, as well as social inclusion and belonging. We believe that this work is highly relational, and that is why peers and community health workers with lived experience are such a success. Our current CHWs were all once volunteers and even participants of our program. They were financially sponsored through training and now certified to do the work they do. Through direct outreach and wellness fairs in collaboration with multiple organizations, we are making 350 contacts a week with people living unsheltered. A few current partners include Cultivate Initiatives, Portland Street Response, OHSU's Harm Reduction and Bridges to Care, Bridges to Change, St. Peter and Paul, Cascadia Be Behavioral Health, Great Circle Recovery, and CODA. We, love <clears throat> we have also been partnering with faith communities in East Portland to do, use their parking lots at these fairs. Faith communities like that of St. Peter and Paul who have already been involved in doing their own community work but just needed collaboration with trained health workers to get people connected. We are proposing that Multnomah County consider funding these day programs and provide, that provide meals and navigation along the 82nd and 92nd corridor for at least four days a week 
and willing to expand through the revenue of the SHS funds. We know that we can go far if we go together. This year to date, we have helped 23 people to long-term stable housing. That number is tripled for transitional shelter and recovering housing placements. Our goal would be to continue to use these direct outreach fairs to assist people who will never call 211 or enter an organization on their own. While providing basic needs like hygiene, hot meals, and Narcan, we can build relationships and motivate people towards better outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Megan Smith, Mina Gilson, Jared Chaby, and Shalane Patel. Good morning. Good morning. You can go ahead and begin. Oh. Um, Hi, thank you for letting me be here. Um, my name is Megan Smith. I'm a woman in long-term recovery. I am also a mother to my teenage daughter who is benefiting from the adolescent services provided by 4D. Um, I started my journey as a peer support specialist and now I'm the co-founder and director of program operations for a new peer rent organization aimed to provide long-term housing while helping to rebuild and heal old ways of thinking. Um, thank you commissioners for your service and taking the time to address addiction. I am requesting that the commissioners direct funds into detox, treatment, and recovery housing. My clients respond well to recovery housing because it allows for them to have a safe place to fall apart into place. Our program offers a safe place to recover at no cost to them for the first year of their journey. We also offer internship and job training opportunities. As a peer-run organization, we meet our residents where they are at. Um, uh, our senior peer, uh, our senior resident just graduated peer support training. Um, so she can get back, give back to what was given to her. Um, it's imperative that we have more funding for housing so that people that struggle with addiction are encouraged to try a new way of living. Thank you, commissioners, for your time. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, I'm Jared. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm an addict and I uh, struggle with addiction and uh, recovery housing has a uh, in treatment has provided me with a uh, structure in my life and um, you know has provided a good foundation and um, you know has given me a good community in my life with uh, just good people who want nothing but goodness for myself and um, you know uh, and they recovering housing has uh, given me hope you know for my life to be better and um, it's just, uh, yeah, I'm just so grateful for the people who brought me into it and uh, the treatment center that I'm at. And um, yeah, so uh, I'm requesting, you know, uh, funding for uh, recovering housing. So, uh, you know, more people like me get to experience a good life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mina Gilson. I am the community center director for Gresham 40. I am also a person in recovery. In the beginning of my recovery, I didn't think I needed treatment. I thought I could do it on my own. I had tried so many times and it failed. Eventually, I decided that a 30-day treatment would be the solution. I completed my 30 days and went home to my same people, places, and things. It wasn't but a week later that I was right back where I started. By this time, I had a whole army of people around me to love and support me, but even that wasn't enough to keep me sober. My family suggested that I go to a long-term rehab. This time, I knew I had to do something different because I was terrified to go back to where I had been. After rehab, I went into sober housing where I learned how to navigate my life in sobriety. Sober housing is so important because it gives people the opportunity to learn how to manage sobriety in everyday life. Today, I request that the SHS funds be invested into detox, long-term care, and sober housing. We need to give people a chance to recover and to find a new way of living. Thank you. Next, we have Sarah Fisher, Trey McChesney, Dina Feldes, and Scott Moore. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my, <clears throat> my name is Troy McChesney. I'm the founder of Premier Sober Living. 
and a new program that's onboarding called Hope Center Recovery, which will be a PHP IOP program, which is partial hospitalization intensive outpatient. I'm also a person in long-term recovery. I have over seven years uh, in recovery. Uh, I was able to achieve this through recovery housing and treatment. I have a 15-year-old daughter who is grateful for my recovery today that I am the single provider for her. Just a little statistics that I, I looked up. You know, we have one of the fastest growing populations of individuals suffering from substance use disorder in the state of Oregon. This is based on SAMHSA. We rank dead last in treatment options and availability for people to get into recovery. That's dead last. Uh, this must change. If you want to reduce or potentially solve an ever-increasing substance use disorder and mental health crisis, we need more resources in fighting the battle. So we have organizations that are in place already that if the funding is directed appropriately, we already have the helpers in place and the structure in place. That's why I'm advocating today that the funds go to detox centers, treatment centers, and recovery housing. Um, I know the funding is sparse. It, for me, as a sober living provider, it can take weeks, sometimes months, to get funding to go through. I know there's some out there. It's just very difficult to access. Individuals need to get through detox first in the short term to, for the recovery journey, and then they can get the access after that that they need to find stable, structured living environments. So when a person is ready to get into recovery, they need access to it immediately. Right now, we lack that access. We do not have enough detox beds when somebody's ready to uh, enter into treatment. Once they're done with the detox, they need to go to a place. PHP IOP programs after detox provide the necessary time to heal. This is a very cost effective program and it utilizes recovery housing without patient treatment. With this model, we can achieve long term recovery for, for a span of three to six months for an individual. The empirical data suggests that the longer an individual is in structured supportive treatment and living environments, the better the outcomes. This is why it's imperative that we invest the recovery funds. Thank you. Good morning. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, my name is Scott Moore with Quest Center for Integrative Health. Multnomah County is home to a diverse LGBTQIA2S plus community that faces unique challenges in accessing safe and stable housing. Discrimination, stigma, and economic disparities can increase housing instability for marginalized populations, most acutely among the LGBTQIA2S plus and BIPOC individuals. And while, the house, and while the need for housing is broadly felt, unfortunately in Portland, no, space, no spaces exist for unhoused transgender and gender non-conforming individuals. Keeping transgender, queer, non-binary, non two-spirit, and intersex folks in their existing living spaces or vouchered in hotels is an expensive choice, but generally the only and safest option. Regarding the 22-23 Metro Supportive Housing Services unanticipated funds to be decided, your support of the LGBTQ IA2S housing collaborative proposal offers a package of services that meet immediate supportive services housing needs for this important and vulnerable population living in Multnomah County, certainly in the short term as you will consider long-term options. As to your responsibilities as the elected officials for Multnomah County Mental Health Authority, Every effort must be made to support the 65 community-based organizations within the four Multnomah County Behavioral Health Resource Networks. I am thankful for the organizations and the individuals here today with that, you, that you honor with your proclamation. Please honor them and the Burns by proclaiming your unwavering support for Measure 110 funding. Those organizations, these people, and these community-based organizations deserve their, your support year-round and any backwalking of those funding of measure 110 funding through uh, state action county support of those actions would be tantamount to just uh, racism and uh, marginalization of, mar of vulnerable people living in Multnomah County thank you thank you good morning hi I'm Sarah Fisher. I'm the priest at Saints Peter and Paul Episcopal Church on 82nd Avenue. I'm also a founding board member of Rahab Sisters. And in keeping with the theme for today, tomorrow I will celebrate 43 years of continuous recovery. So I am grateful to be here this morning and I am grateful to be alive anywhere. 
I'm particularly grateful for Commissioner Brim Edwards' leadership in District 3 and for her support of all of our neighbors, even a broken down little church like ours trying to empty the ocean with a teaspoon. As a person of faith, I'm vocal in my advocacy of neighbors who are living in extreme poverty because they have no one else to advocate for them. But I believe our communities need to unite around solutions for all of our neighbors. I want to support county funding that helps all of us to be better neighbors. Because as Crystal Delahanty said, we can go far together. We partner with PDX Saints Love and Cultivate Initiatives to host a community wellness fair every Thursday. You heard something about the power of these wellness fairs from Crystal. I don't have time to tell you what we as a church are able to accomplish in about four to six hours a week of volunteer time. Suffice it to say that we have been privileged to make a profound difference in people's lives. Imagine what we and organizations like PDX Saints and Rahab Sisters could accomplish with funds for full-time day center services and additional infrastructure. Day centers, which I think are an important step in the pipeline toward the additional recovery services we've been hearing about today. We are situated in a neighborhood where many people live unsheltered. This is because they lack and we lack the resources and infrastructure to get them to better places. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for allowing me the opportunity to address and advocate for recovery services. I am here as a mother of a son who battles mental health and substance use disorder and an executive director for Transcending Hope Recovery Homes. My name is Dina Feldes. I am a biracial Latina woman who identifies with long-term recovery of over 20 years. I have um, six years of navigating a broken system as a medical guardian accessing services for a son with severe thought disorder <laughs> that is addicted to methamphetamine and fentanyl. I don't know if any of you on this, um, commissioners on here on this committee know what it's like to wake up to your son at 4 a.m. in the morning who has broken into your house, who is high on meth and has a thought disorder and is standing over you with a knife. <sighs> the countless opportunities and no openings to slip into detox treatment or housing missed due to no openings and wait times. As a tri-county housing provider, we have 20 locations across the counties which provide Latino and Latina services, family, men, men with children, women, and women with children. <clears throat> Not to exclude our, our new aid and assist housing, which has been highly successful. Transcending Hope takes pride in being able to cater to our community members by working with our community partners to ensure best outcomes. With rising housing costs, we are in a crisis and need extensive funding, su funding towards supportive housing. The positive ripple effect on the healing of generations of trauma, addiction, mental health is unsurmountable when we are able to provide a basic need, housing, and connect to services which are imperative to our community members and families. The impact on emergency room visits, economy, and incarceration is decreased when we are able to empower our people. At a state hospital, a bed runs $15,000 a day versus a bed in recovery housing with supportive services and staff at $26,000 per month. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Terry Konez, Catherine Fukua, Jerry Butler, Angela Todd, and Lightning. Okay. One, two, Awkward. Yeah, um, go ahead. People will come up. You can go ahead and begin. Okay, first of all, I woke up really late. Please excuse the way that I look. <laughs> um, so I got an email from MacBo, and I have had a sick baby all week, and I was like, oh, man, I really hope I get to go and be a part of this amazing um, thing. First, I want to thank my community partners for being here today. This is a very big deal. My name is Catherine. I am uh, considered a person in long-term recovery. I am the very first substance abuse counselor to work for Portland Providence Medical Center in the emergency department. I, for the first time, 
um, and seeing things on the front line, and it is very humbling. Um, I did some notes as I got here. Uh, on a daily basis, we are seeing a rising number of people coming to the ED due to the issues related to the ongoing deadly fentanyl abuse. 40% of the patients that I see on a daily basis are turned back to the streets because I have nowhere to send them. Um, I'm getting a little emotional. Um, I just saw Sarah, who just spoke, Sarah Fisher. Her and I worked really closely with a patient, and I'm not going to share his name due to anonymity. Uh, this patient is 22 years old who would come into the ED probably five days a week, and every time he'd come in, he would be out of his mind, beaten head to toe because he beat himself to the concrete because the drugs that these people are doing are not okay and their mental health is out of their mind. This child now has 90 days sober at, at a treatment center, and I have a part of that. So I'm a little emotional because she just told me that. Um, we need these funds because we need to provide more detox residential beds, silver housing, and more options for me on the front line in an emergency department so that Providence can help. Uh, also, thank you so much. That's it. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, my name is Terry Connor. I'm a career navigator at Southeast Works and a frontline worker that serves the addicted and those in recovery under a major 110 grant. Each day bring new, brings new opportunity for personal growth, renewal, and transformation of many Oregonians who have chosen the path of recovery free from drugs and alcohol. Addiction can destroy self-confidence, family ties, and friendships employment opportunities, and much more. I express the need to support those trying to live a healthy and productive life in recovery and applaud those working to help those struggling with addiction, trying to break the cycle, and encourage those that choose to seek help. The work has just began. As I serve and see firsthand the urgent need for more detox treatment, employment opportunities for those fighting the fight to live a more pro-social and productive life, free from free from alcohol, or drugs, and addiction. Criminality and trying to build a future better than their past. The immediate need for support services and recovery programs here in the Portland and surrounding communities is a must. Together we can reduce harmful consequences of untreated addiction such as violence, failure in schools, job loss, child abuse, crimes, and death. I encourage the, our leaders for more resources and to spread the word that substance abuse is preventable and that addiction is treatable and that recovery is possible. As I'm sitting here, I am living proof, excuse me, I'm living proof that recovery works. Uh, excuse me, I am living proof that recovery works. I stand here, I sit here today as I am forever grateful for those who helped me become the person I am today living a life alcohol and drug free, giving hope to those who struggle and are and being there to provide the opportunity for those ready to gain meaningful employment, earning a living and being pro-social members of society. Thank you, have a great day and remember together we can build a future better than our past. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So a couple weeks ago, there was a sweep that was planned over at the County Needle Exchange at 81st and Ash. Ms. Sarah Fisher just spoke about how wonderful their program you is over your there. name for the record? Oh, yes, excuse me. I'm Angela Todd. I'm from PDX Real. Happy to be here. So the, we did some outreach because there was a sweep going on, and uh, the, um, we spoke with everyone around the block. Right now around the block, people are laying on the ground, um, there's been shootings, there have been people chased with weapons, and there's also some people there that are being very victimized. I had seen a, a John trace, chasing a prostitute with a bat the other day. So we went over there and talked with people, uh, along with Spencer at Loving One Another, who's doing wonderful work. 13 people wanted a place to go. We were frantically calling, trying to figure out, some of them were open to detox, some said they weren't quite ready, but they knew they weren't safe there. 
we were able to get three people um, into shelter. I want to note that there was a bunch of backdoor phone calls to people at all these different places you're providing money to, because if you call through the regular routes, mm -hmm. there's nothing. So a lot of us are just like getting scrappy in the back end, uh, trying to call people and establishing relationships so that we can have people that we talk to get help. <sighs> We, um, we need a database. We need a database of real-time information of what's available and what's available for people who have unique issues depending on what they use, if they're mentally, um, what mental issues they might have, et cetera. I see this as uh, something that needs to be funded. I think everyone's been very clear today that we need more beds. I agree with everything that's been said, but I don't want to overlook the fact that this is a disconnected program and all these wonderful providers here People don't even know who they are. And every time I talk to people, I don't even know where to send people. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jerry Butler. I work with Clackamas County Outreach for Fourth Dimension Recovery. And um, yeah, I agree with a lot of what's been said today. Uh, I, what I see probably the most out doing outreach is we get people, we can get people that first step, you know, maybe to detox or maybe into 4D services or to one of our partners. And um, uh, it's so I, I get that first step done a lot. But what I don't see is the aftercare. Right. There's uh, the there's a lack of beds that I see with the treatment centers. And you have some people that go to detox and they get out within a couple of days and they just go right back into the same um, same cycle. Uh, I'm a person in recovery myself, and you know what saved my life as well was getting arrested. And um, I went through a program called CSAP. It's Clackamas Substance Abuse Program. And uh, it, yeah, it, honestly, it saved my life. And so I tell people a lot when I'm out in the field that you know um, that's my story and that's what saved my life. But that doesn't have to be everybody's. But at the same time, I think that you know if we can get people that help, that structured help, you know, it, it makes a huge difference. Right. And um, I see a lot of success with my peers and people who are required to uh, go through a program. Right. Because when people go to jail and they get back out, it's just a, a repeated recidivism rate. Right. So I think that one of the gaps that there is is people not having that aftercare, not having that structured help. Right. So um, at the end of the day, I think that, you know, if this money can be put towards detoxes and beds, I agree with that stance. And um, I think that, you know, that will make a huge difference and even save lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning. My name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Superhumanity X. Again, I want to say to all the people that have come in and testified, this has been a very meaningful public testimony. And I appreciate the insights that you have given a lot of people. I don't do drugs. And but the insights that you have given have given true meaning and a purpose for why we did the affordable housing bond in 2016 of 258 million, the affordable housing bond in 2018 for 652 million, and also passing the HSS tax over 10 years will bring in $2.4 billion. It is these programs and the people here that are asking for this funding to be utilized and used in the best possible way. That's what the taxpayers approved to have happen. And the people are speaking, and they have certain areas to have that money funded. That is what Multnomah County Health Department is. That is what you are about. Now, the detox treatment and the recovery housing is an area that we need to put more money and more focus into, as the people have stated today. It is so important with this fentanyl crisis that we have to get in front of this and to save the lives of our community members. We have the funding now. There are no excuses from you up here. Fund 
the proper nonprofits, the proper CBOs, fund them the money. You have the money. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that um, concludes public testimony, um, and now we can move on to R1. Thank you. We will now recess at the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners and convene as the Public Contract Review Board. R1, sole source procurement request authorizing the county to contract with Arista MD. Commissioner Meyer removes. Commissioner Jayapal seconds. Approval of R1. Good morning. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. I believe our Chief Clinical Officer is in the room, in the hybrid. So we're doing one person in person and the others on, on online. So she will kick us off. Again, for the record, my name is Anirudh, he, him pronouns. I am here in my capacity as the Information Officer for Integrated Clinical Services. Good morning. Anna, I sent you an unmute request. You can unmute yourself. Bernadette. Oh, Bernadette. Oops, sorry. Nope. Wrong person. My bad. <laughs> That's um, Bernadette. Can you hear me? I am here. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Bernadette Thomas, and I am the chief clinical officer of Multnomah County's Federally Qualified Health Center, Integrated Clinical Services. I am here this morning to request sole source procurement authorization to contract with Arista MD. Arista MD provides asynchronous telehealth referrals linking our patients to more than 70 specialties and subspecialties. E-referrals can replace in-person visits to specialists or can give interim care plans while patients wait for a specialty provider when that wait is too long. Additionally, the patients of our health center face numerous barriers to accessing specialty care, including transportation, access to linguistically and culturally competent care, and long wait times for community specialty providers. E-referrals are completed within four to 24 hours and resulted in the patient's health record where the primary care team can review results, recommendations, and care plans directly with the patient. An example of an e-referral is a primary care provider who is seeing a patient with a skin condition who did not respond to initial treatment. We capture photographs during the visit and we make an e-referral in our electronic health record. We receive those results within four to 24 hours directly into our health record. In our community, in the Portland Metro, our patients wait three to 12 months for a dermatology referral, depending on how the dermatologist prioritizes their concern. The health center selected Arista MD because of a master service agreement that exists between Ochin Epic, our electronic health record vendor, and Arista MD. When Ochin negotiates master service agreements with vendors, OCHIN also negotiates bulk purchasing discounts and shared implementation costs for all of its members, which enables our health centers to offer state-of-the-art innovations to our clients at lower costs. The fiscal impact of the sole source procurement is for the next five years is approximately $2.4 million. A majority of these costs are directly reimbursed by our largest payer, Care Oregon, and the cost for our uninsured patients is paid for by our federal grant, otherwise known as the 330. And I'll hand it over to my colleague, Anna Rood, who can talk to you more about uh, our relationship with Ocean Epic. Thank you, Bernadette. Uh, so we were here maybe a couple of months ago about the Ocean Sole Source Procurement. So uh, it is, uh, it is extremely beneficial for us, but then also the clients of both all of the health department to go with an OCHIN uh, procured vendor. That way, as Bernadette mentioned, there's bulk discounts along with uh, uh, less uh, uh, less interface time with uh, OCHIN, which could be um, over a year at this point in time. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. We'll go to the board for any questions, and we'll start with Commissioner Myron. Thanks to both of you, and um, I, uh, as a healthcare provider, uh, knowing a lot of the challenges that you're faced with and um, that face all of our clients, uh, and knowing OCHIN, 
and knowing your work, I um, fully support this. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Jair Paul. Thank you so much. Um, very supportive. Appreciate appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Commissioner Vern Edwards. No questions. Very supportive. Thank you, Commissioner Simon. Thank you, Chair. Thank thank you, Bernadette and Anna Rood. Uh, I support it as well. Uh, thank you. I don't have any questions. Appreciate you both being here. Did we have any public testimony on this item? Um, no, Madam Chair. All right. May we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jayapal. Aye. Commissioner Brim Edwards. Aye. Commissioner Stegman. Aye. Chair Vega Peterson. Aye. The sole source procurement is approved. R2, proclaiming September 2023 as Recovery Month in Multnomah County, Oregon. Can we have a motion? So moved. Okay, okay Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds approval of R2. I'm sorry, we have to um, Oh, adjourn. we have to reconvene. Thank you, I totally missed that. Okay, so scratch that. We will now adjourn as the Public Contract Review Board and reconvene as the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. R2, proclaiming September 2023 as Recovery Month in Multnomah County, Oregon. So moved. Second. All right, perfect. Commissioner John Paul moves, Commissioner Stegman seconds, approval of R2. Thank you um, so much, everyone, for being here today. Today, we recognize September as Recovery Month, and I want to thank the many, many people who were here with us today, particularly those who have been on a journey of recovery and who have helped others on yours. Your commitment to making sure that, every, that recovery is for everyone, every person, every family, every community, is recognized by me and this board and is valuable to each of us. While this month is important to recognize every year, with the grave increase in fentanyl and polysubstance use running through our community, it is especially important and valuable right now to honor this month and this work. Multnomah County not only has many programs supporting people going through recovery, but also many important connections throughout the recovery community. To date, we've prioritized outreach, stabilization, treatment, and sobering. The health department runs 18 prevention programs, 27 harm reduction programs, 13 treatment programs, and seven focused on recovery. We distribute more than 50,000 naloxone kits every year. And we're incorporating what works into new multi-year strategies that include our partners in healthcare, government, and our safety systems. Not only do I support this programming, but I also support increased investments in recovery-oriented programming. Many of the investments I and this board are making with unspent SHS dollars are specifically to address our behavioral health and substance abuse continuum of care. There has been strong support from me and this board for investment in new withdrawal management, sobering, stabilization, and recovering housing services, which we look forward to funding and creating in partnership with much of the work happening in our community, including our behavioral health emergency coordination network. I know we will be speaking more in depth about these investments later in today's meeting, but I want to mention the general themes now as they are so tied to investing in the community we honor and celebrate with this proclamation. We are focusing on three key areas, recovery-oriented stabilization and transitional housing, withdrawal management and sobering services, recovery-oriented permanent supportive housing. Now is the time when we must step forward with more assistance and better assistance, and when we also must look to partnership across the board because Multnomah County cannot solve this crisis alone. I am very pleased to invite Anthony, DeAndre, and Sadie, and others up to the dais, you're already here, to further reflect on this work and to share today's um, proclamation. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good to see you, Commissioners. Uh, it's always an honor and privilege to be up here and celebrate uh, the proclamation of Recovery Month. Uh, my name is DeAndre Kinyanjui. I am the interim supervisor for the Office of Consumer Engagement. Uh, and you see all the members of the Office of Consumer Engagement up, up here uh, with me. <clears throat> uh, our office is, um, is, is here and we're all in recovery and we leverage um, lived experience in the policy and the practice. So it's always an honor to be up here. I'm gonna let the Office of Consumer Engagement uh, in, introduce themselves and I'll reconvene. Hi, my name is Roger Garf. Uh, Long-term recovery with the Clean Data 1421, and recovery has absolutely changed my life. Thank you. <clears throat> my name is Sadie Campbell. I am also a person in long-term recovery. Uh, my sobriety date is April 17th of 2014, um, and I am in the Office of Consumer Engagement as a peer program specialist. Without recovery, I would be dead. 
Buenos dias. Uh, my name is Mario Cárdenas. Um, I'm also a man in long-term recovery. I just turned 10 years on the 26th of August last month, and, and you know, this is recovery. This is recovery. I'm a face of recovery, and without my recovery and my higher power, I wouldn't have the honor and privilege to be able to serve our community. Um, I just want to, uh, uh, real quick, please support every one of our community partners and, and people that had the courage to come up here and advocate. Um, that being said, I just, uh, I'm really grateful to be a part of this. Thank you. God bless you. Yeah, um, and so my clean date is August 14, 2015. I've known you all forever, um, and I, and I want to do something really quick. Uh, all those who are in recovery, please take a stand. You know, a lot of us at the Office of Consumer Engagement have experienced houselessness, incarceration, and addiction, and uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be up here to be able to give back to the same system that we once experienced. Uh, so thank you for letting us be here, and with that, I'll pass it over to Anthony Jordan. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, my name is Anthony Jordan. I'm the Addiction Services Manager for Multnomah County Behavioral Health. And we're here to celebrate National Recovery Month to provide you with a glimpse of what, recover, what recovery can provide for those um, living with this serious and deadly disease. As you are aware, our community is being devastated by fentanyl and other substances of, of abuse. However, in the midst of all of the suffering, there are glimpses of hope. People are finding ways to get out of their addiction and onto the road of recovery. I am one of those people. In a few days, September the 17th, I will be celebrating 32 years of recovery. The details of my story are like many people we see in our community that are suffering. As the saying goes, or like what Jared said, I used to live and live to use. I was homeless, hopeless, helpless, and there was moments that I lacked the desire to live. I was too much of a coward to kill myself, so I used every day with the hopes that I would have an easy death. Dreams are just waking up, just not waking up, just not waking up. But one day, a person I didn't know said some kind words to me and told me that I was going to be someone. Of course, I looked at this woman like she was crazy and wondered who she was talking about. However, despite the skepticism, what she said stuck with me. Long story short, I found my way to treatment. And there I was told to give myself 90 days of absence from drugs. And if I, if I didn't like my life and how I felt, I could be refunded my misery and return to drug use. <laughs> um, I completed treatment and enter a recovery house. And I just want to let you know um, that I haven't taken them up on that offer since September the 17th, 1991. It was, it was the recovery community that got me through my journey. And I'm glad that we have a recovery community that's strong in, in, in Multnomah County and across the United States and the world. Recovery Month gives, gives us an opportunity to highlight the hopes and possibilities of what an individual can become once they find recovery. Recovery is different for everyone, but the principles are the same. When recovery is in our, when, when a person is in recovery, there's a transformation that occurs within an individual where they find freedom. They are no longer beholden to the vices that rob them of love, family, hope, dignity, and dreams. For many, lost dreams are awakened, and real possibilities are within reach. Many of us, it's not just about putting down the drugs, it's about an active change in our lives that helps us, helps us become acceptable, responsible, and productive members of society. To all people that are suffering, there's a new journey filled with possibilities that, that, that hopes and dreams can be possible. To all the people who are recovering from this disease, I want you to do something for me. Put your index under your chin. Push it up. Be proud and continue your journey. I want to thank you, Chair and Commissioners, for allowing people like me an open place to share my recovery. 
and making space for us. I can tell you from personal experience that you are offering hope and possibilities to many people who are suffering today. And as we move into personal stories, I just want to make, I want to make this clear. Each one of us have our own personal story and our own personal journey, and none of them are the same. And I would like to read before we move to our speakers the definition of what SAMHSA des defines as recovery. It's a process of change through which individuals improve their lives and wellness and live a self-directed life and strive to reach their full potential. And I, I want to thank you for allowing me to share a part of my story and the recovery journey. And I'm going to turn it over to Mario to introduce our first speaker. speaker. Oh, oh, I thought you was going to introduce okay. So we have our first speaker, which is Ricardo Garcia. Hello, everyone. OK. Um, dear commissioners, my name is Ricardo Garcia. I'm someone in long-term recovery, two years. I'm from Eastern Oregon, a small town called Hermiston, Oregon. And today, I am the, I am the Latinx Burn Program Navigator and Coordinator at MHAAO. I would like to thank the commissioners here for taking their time here to address addiction. I struggled with addiction at an early age, but with fentanyl from the age of 16 in 2016. Due to there being no services in Eastern Oregon, thanks to Multnomah County and the great Latino providers we have in Multnomah County, I got clean in late 2020 through VOA intensive outpatient. Then I did, an, then I did outpatient for another year with Puente Central City Concern all culturally specific programs. I'm now 24 years old. I was taught the tools and knowledge to have a healthy, sustainable recovery and had long-term recovery support. This is what really worked for me. And I'd also like to say thanks to Multnomah County and community partners. I got four credentials and now work in the field. And a thanks to Juntos Northwest, Mario Cardenas, Ricardo Rodriguez, who provided all my trainings. I am asking the commissioners to please direct funds into free scholarships for continuous educations like CRM, CADC trainings, cohorts. Free, free scholarships for continuous education, that's, that's what's been working and helping our Latino community, and it's also been healing our Latino community. And please to direct funds into other culturally specific programs. There is not enough programs to send our Latinos. Part of me feels like we're being failed. But I know a lot has been done for me in the state of Oregon. Another detox as well because it gets all the bad stuff out. But more is definitely needed, such as more residential treatment or intensive out outpatient attached with housing and long-term recovery support is heavily needed. That's what healed my scars and wounds. Thank you all. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing our next speaker. Um, she's a friend of mine. Dr. Hilde, she's going to be um, presenting her um, story via um, the virtual world. Um, she's a board certified psychiatrist focused on youth. Um, she's currently uh, working with the Confederate Tribes of the Grand Ronds, Great Circle Recovery, and the Opioid um, Treatment Program. I've known Anna, my friend, for a very long time. Um, we, we sort of grew up together. I'm so proud to call her my friend, and she's got that beautiful smile, and so looking forward to hear her story. Anna, you all. Thanks, Anthony. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's really an honor to be here, and I just want to share a little bit of my story and, and what it means to be in recovery. So, like uh, Tony said, my name is Anna, um, and I am a person in long-term recovery. Um, my clean date is 321-2007, and I uh, struggled with uh, an opiate addiction. Um, so it's a little uh, emotional for me uh, when I share my story because I think it's it's just this is powerful. Recovery is really powerful. Um, so I think like most people and, and what statistics show is as most of us that um, have substance use disorders start using in our adolescent years. And that was certainly true for me. And, um, you know, the first time I, I had alcohol, I blacked out. Um, I didn't know that that was a, a warning sign. Um, uh, and I continued to um, drink alcohol in a like a binge type manner for for many years as a as an adolescent. And but I was also very um, high achieving and 
I went to college and um, I did quite well, but there was always an element of substance use that was in the background. And I think the other thing that's important for me to note is that there was um, undiagnosed um, mental health uh, conditions um, that I never got adequate treatment or even recognition of. And so often my use was a way of managing some of the underlying uh, conditions that I was that I was dealing with and and what happened is what happens with most people is there was progression and um, I ended up uh, using um, becoming addicted to heroin and um, uh, and I was using that substance while I applied to medical school and I got into medical school and I'm still not really sure how I did that but I did um, and uh, but my use got worse and worse and um, essentially the way that I think about this my life got really really small. And all it was about was getting and, and using and figuring out how I could get more. And I could see that my life was like tilting and, and about to fall over. And I, I feel really fortunate that I could sort of see all of that coming. And, um, and I asked for help. Um, and I reached out to um, the dean of my medical school and I, I let them know I needed help. Um, although actually that was after I went to Hooper Detox. And despite the fact that I, I had probably access to other resources, I knew about Hooper. And the reason why I knew about Hooper is because of, of harm reduction and needle exchange. And so I, these tools work and I was able to get into detox and then I reached out for help and I went to treatment. Um, and and uh, that saved my life. And, and what I do recall is um, there, were, there was someone at Hooper Detox who, who said this to me, and I'll never forget it, And because uh, I didn't actually really think I had that big of a problem. I thought I just needed to go to detox for like five days, and then I could go back and start winter term of med school, <laughs> which seems so ridiculous now. Um, and they said to me, you know, if you had an illness, you know, if you had cancer, would you get treatment? And I was like, Psh, of course I would. And they were like, well, you have an illness and you need treatment. And it really, you know, even though I was sort of in that avenue, like I just couldn't see it that way. And I think that's that's um, the world that we live in and the, the stigmatization and still really a struggle to understand that that addiction, uh, substance use is an illness. Um, I went to treatment and I did really well. I went into Oxford housing and I went back to med school and my life got really, really big again. And um, and it was it was amazing. Uh, but what happens to me uh, or what happens to many other people happened to me and, and um, I got overwhelmed and I didn't know how to have good boundaries and um, I took on way more and I and then I started I stopped um, utilizing the resources that were available in my community and I relapsed and um, and I was really afraid that I was going to lose everything. And so I, I lied about it and um, and things uh, over about a year got really bad and um, and I came to the point where I actually didn't want to be alive anymore and um, and I came really close to to not choosing to live and then um, I had uh, a moment of clarity and I reached out to someone that I knew in recovery and um, and they just said to me you don't know what's going to happen and you need to get to yourself get to a meeting and you need to get help and um, I had to take a leave from school and I had to go back to treatment. Um, uh, but I did that and um, and I was eventually able to to return to med school. It took a, it took a long time and it was a, a, a hard fought journey because there's still a huge amount of stigma in the medical community. Um, but I was able to complete medical school and um, I was able to get into a residency program, which was really difficult because it's part of my record. I um, like when I apply for anything, I have to be very clear about my history. And there's a huge amount of, um, like I said, um, stigma around that. Um, but I went to uh, to residency and um, I was a chief resident and um, I went to fellowship and uh, got a um, uh, in child and adolescent psychiatry, and now I work in this field. But uh, and and I'm passionate about working with young people who struggle with addictions and mental health, uh, because I think that we have an opportunity to change the directories of people's lives. And and what what I see and uh, like I can't believe what I get to do each and every day. Um, and I how I see recovery is um, I get to be the best version of myself each and every day 
and I work so that I can help other people to be the best version of themselves each and every day, uh, every day. And I'm, I can't believe, um, what my life looks like. I have a 10 year old daughter who's never seen me loaded and, um, have a beautiful relationship with her. And, um, and I'm just, it's just, uh, I, and I get to do this because there were people around me that walked me through this and help me through it. And that's what it's about. It's about our community and helping one another. And I am so honored to be in this room uh, virtually with you all. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna pass it over to so DeAndre. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for allowing us to be here. I just wanted to say thank you to all the speakers who spoke up on the panel, people who spoke earlier. Uh, and I just wanted to remind everyone that um, You've heard a lot of people speak today who have addiction, some people who come from upper middle class homes to people who come from broken homes and addiction is the one thing that makes us all equal. We all end up in the same place. And I just wanna thank all the speakers for speaking and I'm gonna pass it to Sadie to read the proclamation. Thank you so much. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners finds, A, Recovery Month is recognized every September. Multnomah County and the Behavioral Health Division use this time to increase awareness about substance use disorders and promote our citizens' right and promise for recovery. Through advocacy, education, and public recognition of those in recovery, we demonstrate the power and proof that people can and do achieve long-term recovery goals. B, fentanyl and polysubstance use has had an unpredictable, life-threatening impact on our community. Today's soundbite news bombards us with dire images and tries to convince us that little is being done to slow the use of drugs in our community. C, we recognize the complexities and challenges that individuals may face at any phase in their journey to recovery, and we acknowledge there are both internal and external barriers that people with substance use challenges face every day. D, yet today we pause to write our own headline. Recovery is for everyone, every person, every family, every community. Today we pause to call attention to recovery success stories and give thanks to the tremendous work of peers, providers, community members, and county staff as they st strive, to daily, strive daily to provide effective, culturally responsive, and trauma-informed treatment and recovery services for all of our impacted community members. E, connection to community is more critical than ever. It is often said that it takes a village. We are that village. Recovery is for everyone the people who are struggling with addiction, the people who are in, in any phase of their recovery journey, the families affected by those suffering from addiction, and the community members who want to help, even those who don't fully understand this epidemic. F, today's proclamation celebrates hope and aims to reduce stigma surrounding individuals with substance use challenges. Multnomah County continues to emerge from more than three years managing the impacts of COVID, including the isolation that has contributed to an increase in the acuity of issues related to substance use. G, the Multnomah County Board of Com County Commissioners, the Health Department and the Behavioral Health Division is proud to move in partnership with community treatment and recovery support services providers toward a more ho hopeful future. We will continue to reach out to our community members in need of services and support to overcome substance use challenges, improve our effectiveness, and growing our village. H, sharing inspiring stories of recovery builds understanding and promotes wellness for all Multnomah County residents. September Recovery Month allows us an opportunity to center around this growing need and engage our community in awareness and support of this work. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners proclaims the month of September 2023 is proclaimed to be Recovery Month in Multnomah County, Oregon. All county residents are invited to commit to continuing supportive recovery for those impacted by substance use disorders. This month, we invite you to celebrate those who are achieving their goals of recovery and wellness and encourage you to share information about programs, resources, and services to help others take their first steps toward a healthier life. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of you being here today. We're gonna to go to the board for any um, comments and we'll start with um, Commissioner Jarrett Paul. Oh, is yours not working? Oh, I have, okay. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I think my, my absent-mindedness and asking for the mic uh, just uh, testifies to it's, it's hard to go first after all of that. Um, thank you all.
Thank you all so much for being here. Um, everyone who came, who waited, uh, who shared their stories, who shared their work, um, to the panel for sharing your stories. It is so essential and so important, um, you know, building understanding, uh, building empathy, building support, and, and, and providing hope um, above all. And uh, I think what we know is that there's so many people out there who are in the depths of their addiction, who can't see out of that tunnel, um, who don't think that there is possibility or hope. And every time you come here and do this, and it's a big ask to have you come here and do this over and over again, um, but every time you do, you give all those people hope and the knowledge that there is possibility of coming out of that tunnel. Um, I, I wanna, you know, I, I can't quote everything I heard that made an impact on me, as it obviously did, but just a few things. Um, on a, your statement that your life got really, really small, and then your life got big again, that just was such a powerful uh, description of both what addiction was like for you and what recovery has become. And um, your entire story, uh, like all your stories, so, so very hopeful. And then I think some of these quotes, Anthony, may have been yours. Um, Together, we can create a future better than I, our past. Absolutely, we can. There's a new journey filled with possibility, hopes, and dreams, and that's possible. Absolutely, it is. Um, I think the other thing I want to say is whenever we have proclamations, it's, it's important that we uh, take action on what we hear. And so much of the testimony this morning relates to the conversation we're gonna have later this morning about how to invest funds. And um, I hear loud and clear what you are all asking for. And you know, I think it's gonna be really important that as we make these decisions about the SHS funds, we are acting on what we heard. And what I heard was um, a, a demand, I'm not gonna call it a request, a demand for treatment and because we're talking about housing funds, um, a demand for that, that transitional stabilization and recovery housing, which we have far, far, far too little of. So that's, that's one thing that I think we need to take action on. The other um, is to say that, you know, we're gonna make some decisions about investments, we'll put some money in, but the need for the overall assessment of the gaps that are out there and how we fill those gaps, that, that is also crystal clear. That is the bigger piece. And I, I, I have, and I know others have had conversations about planning an assessment that's happening about exactly what those gaps are. Um, and Chair, you know, I'd like to request that we have a briefing. Um, the, the effort I know about is the one being led by Andy Menhall, HealthShare Oregon, Care Oregon about what are the gaps and how do we marshal the resources to fill them. And it's not just Multnomah County. I mean, the, we're talking about just for the metro area, the gap is somewhere around half a billion dollars, maybe more. So we can put in pieces of it, but we, we absolutely need the state. You know, thank you, Oregon Recovers, for the advocacy that you're doing. We need the state, we need federal funding as well, and, and we need, we need a, a, a plan and implementation of that plan. So. Um, you know, those, those are the two action items that I've put down for myself. But again, thank you all so very much for being here. It is very much appreciated. You are appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Commissioner Brim Edwards. Well, I think um, everybody here this morning uh, who told their story um, bravely and courageously, um, you've given, I think, others hope and you've given me a gift as a decision maker and a policy maker because um, we're about ready to head into making some big decisions and um, I'm gonna be keeping your stories um, and the gift that you were given of recovery top of mind and not just the vote on this proclamation but really what actions can we take. We have, we have I think, a really an unprecedented opportunity to make a huge investment in recovery housing um, and treatment. And um, that we, you don't often get that opportunity as a policymaker where there's funds available that you can make um, sort of a big swing and make a huge impact. Um, so I, I'm really appreciative that you, all, each one of you who told your stories um, or who have shared it in other forums with us, um, that you've given us um, really the foundation and, and the, um, I think, 
inspired us to, to take that big swing um, and to really make a difference. And um, I hope that it not only um, causes us to take very strong, decisive action, but that we also, it allows us to bring in um, our partners at the state, the city, and our nonprofit partners, and the healthcare community, so that um, working together, because um, as Commissioner Jayapal mentioned, um, it's a, it potentially is a huge investment that we need, we need to make, um, but if we do it together, um, I think we're, we're gonna be successful, so I'm absolutely supporting the proclamation, um, and I think it sets the foundation for um, a much bigger action that we could potentially take. So thank you, everybody, for this morning. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you all for not just sharing your stories, but really uh, with the essence of who you are as individuals and the challenges that each of you have faced to be here today. Um, Anthony, I really appreciated your sh you sharing your story about someone told you that you were going to be someone, um, and I would argue that you are someone. You all are someone. Um, the, the hope and the possibility that you talked of, uh, I love the recovery community because you all have this incredible bond with one another, uh, and I can, I can feel it in this room uh, when I spend time with the folks out at 4D uh, that do just like amazing, incredible work. I know you don't have enough funding, uh, but I know how important that is, and uh, you know, recently I took a tour of Hooper Detox, and they echoed every single thing that has been said here today. Um, they told me that they see 3,000 people a year per fiscal year, and they turn away 1,700. That's crazy, and these are, these are people that voluntarily want help and support, and you are absolutely right. What are we doing? I mean, there are people that are service resistant, and we spend an inordinate amount of time trying to get them to accept services, but it seems like we're ignoring the people who are like begging for services, and I think that those people end up being service resistant at some point if we don't intervene. So um, I just wanna say I, I totally agree and, and thank this board. Last year uh, we passed um, some funding for the Salvation Army Bridgeway of Hope, which is um, like 90 beds of residential um, transitional housing for men in recovery, and that we have to start talking about high barrier recovery, people that cannot, do not want to be around other people that are still in the depths of their addiction. And uh, we've heard that loud and clear from all of you, and um, I think it's time that, that we really take heed to what you're saying, and I wanna thank you all for being here. Thank you, Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who has testified here today, or in, and has just simply shown up here today. I know many of you really well. I know your advocacy, your work over the years, your tenacity. For those I don't, I sort of feel a bit like I do. And I appreciate you so, so much. Um, your words are powerful and your words are action. I wrote many of your individual comments down and will be keeping them in my heart. Thank you to our panelists. Um, wow, you made this so real. Ricardo and um, Dr. Anna. Anthony, thank you for sharing of yourself and your story. I know it makes a difference to so many people to see where you are and to know where you've been and to know that those two are, that is you, and you have made the journey, and you continue in the journey. And DeAndre, your work has been so incredibly meaningful, and I've been honored to know you, to introduce you at Peerpocalypse. 
um, working with you on the blueprint for better behavioral health, consult consulting you when there are issues around behavioral health, that I need someone to talk to about what the reality is, um, what people are experiencing, because you know it, you've lived it, and you continue to connect with the community. Um, I, I have to say the mental health deep systems analysis that I sponsored, one of the key things it called for was someone with um, lived experience in leadership at the county, and that has resulted in the position you are in. So you have, ex you have done us all so proud. I've said it before, as a, as a doctor, I, addiction is not a moral weakness. It's not a lack of willpower. It's not a n lack of willingness to stop using. It is a chronic relapsing medical illness, and it's accompanied by s very specific and significant brain changes and other changes. We need to have the same approach we take to treating other medical illnesses, that compassion, the appropriateness of treatment and healing and services that we have when we treat other serious medical conditions. <coughs> right now, um, I, you made it very clear, hopefully we were already aware of this, but um, you made it so real today. We are in a crisis and we have more resources than ever before to actually make a difference. It's our responsibility as the local mental health authority and as the local public health authority to use these resources wisely. Next, um, it's been mentioned, we're talking about how to spend $50 million, I, I mean, staggering numbers, of unspent supportive housing services measure uh, unanticipated revenue. As we've heard from so many in the recovery community today, and as we've heard from providers, consumers, and so many for years, this is recovery-based housing is one of the linchpins, a key thing that can change a revolving door from streets to jails to ERs into a one-way entrance to healing and recovery for thousands of people in our community. I'm advocating today for $25 million of our funds to be invested in recovery-oriented housing where people can continue the journey of healing that they start, whether it be in jail, in their own home, in, at Hooper Detox, at Unity, wherever that journey begins, we need the place for you to go. You need the support services so you can be successful in whatever it is you, whoever you are and choose to be. So I know some, some will be concerned about the cost of the Crown Plaza, we'll probably be talking about some of this later, but the facility, um, purchasing the Crown Plaza is a bargain, but even if you still think the cost is too high, think about the cost to our community of not investing in this recovery housing at a scale that can make a difference. As Commissioner Brim Edwards said, it's a big swing and it can make a huge impact. We'll also be debunking a huge amount of the misinformation that's been circulating. And people do need treatment. I, we heard this from you loud and clear. Um, the way that I think about this is, yes, we do. And I, <laughs> and, and I hear, yep, hear, hear. <laughs> um, oh. But, Investing in more treatment without the places for people to go a couple of months after people get out of treatment, just kicking the can down the road. We need both. That will be throwing good money after bad. So we need both the treatment, but if we're investing in that, we need the places to go for people to stabilize and be. And right now we don't have that place. It's time to aim high, and community and connection is the foundation on which recovering and healing can happen. Thank you to this community who has shown up today um, in such a beautiful way. So I just want to thank all of you so much for being here, for taking the time to be here, to, to, to give your testimony today, to be a part of this really meaningful um, proclamation, which is always so 
touching and, and enriching and just um, really creates a community among everyone in this room, everyone who's watching. Um, I, and I just will say, like, after having been sitting up here for, you know, seven years plus, um, this is this is about action, right? This is about taking these words that we hear, taking the knowledge that we know, using your um, your expertise, your experience, your heart, your community to really like turn that into action. I think you will see that um, in investments we're doing. I think you will see that. Um, um, Anthony, thank you so much for the work that the health department is doing, DeAndre, all of you for, for moving this forward and really creating that plan that we need. Um, and um, and I want to especially thank everyone who shared their stories today. Anthony, thank you so much for sharing yours. I think that was one of the first times I had heard it, so I really appreciate that. Um, and that's the commitment that we have as the board is to really, you know, to really fund the things that you're asking for, the detox, the recovery housing, the treatment, right? Those are the things that, that I've heard over and over again. Um, and making sure that this community is a place where people who, who are looking for that help, for looking that hand up, for looking for someone to tell them that um, that they are they have something special, um, that we have those resources there. It's a long road, and as Commissioner Jayapal says, it's not it's not just here at the county. We have to be engaging our healthcare systems. We have to be engaging our state, our federal part, um, partners, um, using every Medicaid dollar that we can. Right, but um, but this is um, but but we are a place where. Um, we can bring the people together, we can have those conversations, and um, we can use the, the wisdom of this community to, um, to put that into action. So thank you all very much for being here. Tasia, can we have a vote, please? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Bryn Edwards? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Vega Peterson? Aye. The proclamation is adopted. Thank you, and we are gonna take a brief recess as we uh, move down to the um, tables for our work session, so we'll reconvene in just a couple minutes. Thank you.
Th can you, everybody can hear this is working? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, welcome. We are back in, um, recess is over. Uh, we're back in session and we'll move on to R3, which is, uh, do you want to read it out? Yes. R3, supportive housing services, unanticipated revenue, and un unallocated American Rescue Plan carryover budget proposal and work session. All right. Thank you so much, Tasia. So um, first of all, I just want to start off by thanking everyone for continuing to engage in this process of digging in and um, in what is it on? Yeah. Yeah. People can hear. Okay. Um, to digging in around the um, this piece of the an unanticipated supportive housing services measure funding that we do have. Um, this additional funding, while a welcome development, is really out of season in its timing and has led us to kind of recreate a mini budget process just months after the heavy lifting of passing the FY24 full budget. We've also allocated unspent SHS funding on top of that, making it a very usual, unusual body of work for the board. Um, so I appreciate everybody's patience and diligence, the desire to understand the details and the hard work in getting us to this point of making key investments that will improve our homeless, homelessness um, services system in a myriad of different and important ways. Um, everybody's office should have received a printout of um, a presentation where um, in light of time, we're not gonna go through that. We're just gonna have Christian kind of do a high level overview, but everybody's office should have received the printout um, for that. Um, and everybody had received a memo on Tuesday evening um, detailing all the, the proposals. Nothing has changed from that. What I hope that you'll see um, reflected in the pro proposal that I had sent is, is really your proposals. Because the bulk of this package comes from the ideas generated by um, all of you. It also contains ideas from the community, particularly our providers, and also the Joint Office of Homeless Services and our Behavioral Health Division. My primary considerations in this proposed investment package were threefold. One, that we make sure that we're spending our dollars, dollars across the community in the most effective way. Two, that these investments focus on increasing the efficacy and efficiency of our overall response to this crisis. And three, we have too many people sleeping outside and must prioritize their health and safety over many things. People with complex challenges will be impacted by the time, place, and manner law, and this will make the active crisis on our streets worse if we don't address the needs proactively. With that in mind, the package before you creates 515 new shelter beds. Investments in shelter and behavioral health make up more than half of the overall proposed allocations, sharing the larger story of our board's collective prioritization of these gaps and of our current system. This proposal also includes investments that create stronger bonds with the behavioral health systems and meet many of the needs of the most medically fragile members of our community, with over 20 beds and 100 vouch uh, over 100 vouchers across our behavioral health response system to provide more flow through in programs and much more access overall. We're also investing in upstream strategies to reduce the likelihood of homelessness with eviction prevention services and emergency rental assistance. Where we can, we should continue investing smartly in rental assistance and housing stability services. And through these investments, we'll require departments and providers to provide timely report backs around housing stability. And we're resourcing and programming the day-to-day -day work of moving people off the streets and into shelter and housing. We must also prioritize building better, more sustainable, more efficient, and more data-driven systems. That is why we're investing in our shelter into housing flow through. Because while we are investing in more shelter beds than ever before, what we need is people moving into shelter and then on to housing. This will make our shelter system more temporary, more responsive, homelessness less debilitating, our systems more efficient, and the experience of homelessness brief. That is why our shelter flow through proposal is such a critical investment. When we increase the number of people who flow through and ultimately exit our homelessness response system, we will see a significant jump in the number of people who will be directly impacted by our support. And a focus on this is reinforced by the audits and structural recommendations we've received in the recent months, including our ongoing systems data work, our response to the joint office audit, and our upcoming opportunity to incorporate recommendations from the health healthcare management associates into the joint office's priority and work. I want to challenge each of you to use these lenses in your review of this proposal and our discussion of it, along with any of the proposals or amendments you make from here. 
No one should characterize this as a take it or leave it proposal. This is a collaboration and I haven't proposed allocating every last dollar. I fully expect and welcome that you may have additional ideas and priorities to propose and discuss and I'll welcome that process. I will also um, speak to our amendment process before this session wraps up. Lastly, I want to say that some of the proposals that have come up in previous discussions are not reflected here, including adjustment and reduction in some of my proposals. And I'm happy to answer questions about that or discuss any of them further. I want to know that many of these proposals have been right-sized for where we are in this fiscal year. I want to set realistic goals for the joint office and our providers for their budgets. So proposals have been trimmed to reflect our shorter fiscal year timeline, which will help ensure that we get funding out as expected. And I'm also working to see how we can facilitate those dollars getting out. Um, and I'll share more about that as that work can, uh, progresses. So I'm now gonna um, invite Christian to go through the budget. I also know that we have Stacy, April, and folks from our departments here who are ready to answer questions about specific investments. So um, Christian, if you wanna go ahead and take it away. Before we get started, can I, we just have a time check about what our proposed end time is and so how we can chunk out how long the presentation is and then how long we have each for discussion just so we don't have an unfortunate ending of the it, you know, mid midpoint in time, just so we can understand yeah. what the yeah. increments of time are so we so can use that. We're gonna go until 1230 today, so we're gonna increase the end. And, and, and so how long is the presentation? Two, oh, two minutes, it's okay. What, it's like too slow. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Chair, Commissioners, Christian Elkin, County Budget Director, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I just wanted to hit two highlights to talk about the available resources that you're talking about, your proposals, and then you all will, will get to um, determine how necessary to spend those. So we have essentially two pots or buckets of funding available at this juncture. The first one is the Metro and anticipated revenue. That's $50.5 million. Um, as you all heard from Metro when they came to talk to you about their forecast and their process, we were notified of this funding, this unanticipated revenue in late June of 2023. And it was revenue that was collected for 2023. So it, it did not fit neatly into our budget process that we, we had already adopted our budget, we had already, and so we were being informed of this. As you know, Metro is in charge of collecting, distributing, and forecasting the revenue that's available to us, and so we will continue to work with them. Um, part of the challenges of that forecast for this, um, for fiscal year 2023 and why they had forecasted we would collect $225 million across the Tri-County. They ended up collecting $336 million across the Tri-County area. That leaves our portion of that as a $50 million increase. Um, there was a lot of uh, returns that came in for first year late payers in, in this current um, round of payment. Also, the tri-county trends exceeded expectations around employment, employment growth, and they were just much stronger, especially in Washington and Clackamas County. And then additionally, um, as we've seen on our side for Multnomah County and the business income tax, we've seen record profits in the business income taxes across, and that was true both for uh, Washington and Clackamas County as well. And so what you're seeing is, is Josh and Metro working really hard to really figure out how to right size that forecast. I believe they'll be coming back to us in the next few months talking about how much of this, because uh, they also think that the forecast they use for fiscal year 2024 is gonna need to be revisited, how much of that forecast is gonna be ongoing and we can expect in the out years and how much of that is gonna be one time only. As of right now, this $50.5 million that they've informed us of is one time only in nature um, because a lot of it is you know, tax collection from previous years, so it's not expected to be ongoing. Additionally, during um, the last three budget processes, we've um, been fortunate to have the American Rescue Plan dollars that came from the federal government. Um, when we first received that allocation in fiscal year 2022, we received $157.8 million. The board committed to spending that in essentially two fiscal years because there's an end date on that funding and because the funding was given to us to address the, or to address the immediacy of the pandemic. And so we uh, committed to five um, priority areas, sorry, let me scroll down so I get them correct, um, in spending that funding. Uh, and we've talked about this multiple times. Um, the first is the public health emergency response, the crisis response, 
core services and supporting people in our care, uh, restoring services impacted by budget re re reductions, which the county did not have to do in a meaningful way without funding, and then any critical county infrastructure that we needed to respond to the pandemic. So we budgeted the first tranche in fiscal year 2022. We budgeted the second tranche in fiscal year 2023. And then during the 24 budget process, um, we were talking about how we're kind of at that final spend of that funding because we didn't spend 100% in fiscal year 2023. We were trying to provide you an estimate of what we thought that underspending would be. So when the chair's budget was released, we uh, estimated about $18.4 million of American Rescue Plan that was available to program into the budget. Then during May, we came back to you and we said we're tightening that forecast. Um, that we, there was another $4.5 million available. The board chose at that time to uh, adopt an amendment and that was to fund the Sun School Family Resource Navigators for one more year. And then we also put a budget note in front of you that said that the minute the, uh, the CFO and the budget director can get that final number of the available American Rescue Plan, we would bring it back to the board. That's this $12.4 million number that I believe the chair sent out to um, your teams on September 1st. And so we wanna make sure that that funding is available for you as you make these hard decisions about how to invest in really these emergency and priority areas at the county. And with that, I am going to have Teja go to slide seven, I believe. And uh, that's my two minutes. And if anyone has any questions about where the resources came from and are available for. Any questions on that? Yes. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Um, and so when do these ARPA funds have to be allocated and or spent? The, the American Rescue Plan dollars have to be spent by December 31st, 2024. There's some conversation, Commissioner, you'll hear, I think other jurisdictions talk about having them um, committed by fiscally, by December 31st, 2024. I think it's really important that this board has really seen this funding as not a lifeline for county government or for our services, but that it was meant to address the pandemic and the impacts from the pandemic, both the public health impacts and then the crisis is in our community and recognizing that the recovery has not been even. And so this board has really challenged to put that funding out into the community and to, you know, to try to resolve or mitigate the impacts of the pandemic. And so that's why we have been so diligent about ensuring that that funding is moving and responding to the crisis. Great, thank you, Christian. And what about the deadline for the um, unanticipated SHS money? Is there a deadline that we, that is a great question. I would have to ask Metro. I don't believe each county is approaching it in the same ways. And so I, I would ask maybe um, Commissioner Jibes, not to put you on the spot, Commissioner Jibes, but if that has been discussed at the Regional Oversight Committee or? Not that I'm aware of, but I would expect that since it's FY23 unanticipated, if we don't use it by the end of the year, there's going to be the potential for another cap. But that, I mean, that's, that's my guess, but I don't know. And that's one of the reasons why in looking at the dollar amounts that were being proposed, we tried to right size it for things that could be spent this fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Christian. All right, so I wanna just open it up for a board discussion. Everybody's had a chance to review the memo. There is a hard copy, like I said, of a presentation that kind of walked through things more um, clearly. I will just remind folks that we really looked at um, the investments in in bigger buckets that was really looking at expanding shelter access, um, improving our systems and access to services, increased daytime support access, um, the shelter um, flow through to housing, preventing households from homelessness, and behavioral health and crisis stabilization um, and housing services. So that was the big buckets. Um, there's different, um, it, it's been kind of chunked out, you know, the, the details are um, in the memo, but of all of the kind of different ways, um, all, of, all of the priorities from the board, the priorities from the Joint Office of Homeless Services and our Behavioral Health Division um, have, have kind of shown up in those areas. And then there's also in the memo, the final part was the ARP dollar spending, which um, some of those are, are for, you know, more of the <coughs> Joint Office <coughs> of funding, but others are more expansive than are we, are we gonna have just, I, I just have comments I'd like to yeah, read. I don't think we'll have time to like have meaningful interaction about, about that. So I, I just have a, some, 
prepared comments to read. So whenever, it's probably a few minutes, and I can take whatever that portion of time is. So it's re responsive to, to the proposal, but okay. Okay. Well, how best to do for, it. For our uh, you know, board to have a discussion together, so I want to open it up for that for folks who want to. And, and I just want to echo on the, the time piece. Yeah. Um, I have some comments and questions, yeah. and my comments and questions alone would take the remaining yeah. half yeah. hour. Yeah. So you know, I think we're going to need more time yeah. for this. And that's fine. And that was one of the things when I um, sent the email out is you know, our, our timeline, like initial timeline when we were looking at that was to, to have a vote next Thursday. We obviously had so many people who were very interested in testifying today that we had an hour and a half of public testimony, which was um, not expected. So we'll, um, we'll um, make sure that we have sufficient time for board discussion and we can, we can adjust that so we can, we can, like next week, we can come back and have a further discussion on this. But I will, I will say like this is a time, especially if you have questions about specific proposals to bring them forward so that um, because we do have department folks here to, who are able to address them. So, uh, so oh, in go ahead, question, so I, I do think it would be helpful if people had comments to like understand where, because actually almost all the money has been allocated. Um, so it would be helpful for me to hear people's just like top of top of mind um, thoughts or um, just at a top line. So we're ready for like, hopefully a actually a discussion next week when we have more more time, but it would be helpful for me not just to have questions, but also to hear, um, you know, where um, other commissioners feel like we hit the mark or question or where we need more focus or there's thoughts. more clarity. Yeah. Um, so I, I would hope that we at least have a brief time for that um, yeah. versus like heading into next week and just only having questions today. Yeah, I I would love to raise some top of line thoughts that that yeah. address so, the proposal. So does anybody have any specific questions that they want? <laughs> they want to ask while, while the department folks are here in the room right now. And if not, that, then we can move on to that. I just want to make space for that. Chair, I'd like more clarification around the task sites. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just kind of unclear. I know that we've already allocated some money, so I want to understand what this additional money is going for. Uh, I believe it's operational. Uh, and, you know, like what is the long, what is the runway? Of, are, are we going to be funding, I don't know how many sites they have, six? I mean, so I just kind of like to need, need to know the whole entirety and what we as a board are planning on funding and not funding. Go ahead. Uh, so I'm happy, and I can start off and then you okay. can take it. So these are operational dollars. This was a um, result of um, requests that we've had from the city, as also, but it's also been raised um, by some of the commissioners here in terms of funding the operations for, again, the, the second and third task sites that we have funded the um, capital costs for in, our, um, in the actions that we took last week. Uh, thank you. For the record, my name is Stacey Borg, okay, she and her pronouns. I'm a policy advisor to the chair. Uh, Commissioner Stegman, thank you for your question. Uh, so what is in the proposal today is a $16 million investment to, for the operations for two task sites. That's site number two and site number three. Uh, as we shared last week, the uh, CAP, the Corrective Action Plan, and the board's support for that, oh, it's the mask, um, funded the capital investments for those two sites. This uh, proposal funds the operations. Task site number two is, as of now, scheduled to uh, open in November, and this is directly from our colleagues at the city. Task site number three is slated to open in January. And so uh, this funding is for the operation of, of what time period will that cover? Uh, it's one year of operations. One year? Yep, per it's site. Per site. So the 16 million is for operations for one site, or for two sites for one year, so it's $8 million. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I mean, I guess I'm just having kind of a hard time understanding, okay, so like what, you know, obviously we're talking about one time only money today, but like understanding the larger frame of how, what about the ongoing funding and, you know, again, this goes into our budget season and it, so I just feel like we're just, we're, we're getting just a tiny uh, tunnel vision picture and not really understanding, uh, you know, where we're going in the future. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, and I, I, I know I'm getting into budget season, but it's hard to make these, you know, these one-off decisions without understanding what our intentions, what our plan, like, I mean, are we planning on funding 
uh, the task sites from here on out, both capital and operations? So I think that, that is, and I, I know we have our attorneys here, so we can't really talk too much about the net. You'll keep us up straight with the, the budget, not getting too much, but I think that is up to the board to decide. This is a proposal for this funding for right now. Um, to, and to have operations for a year, I think for the longer term, that would be up for this board to decide longer term. Um, but when we have the next, and I also think it will be a part of the conversation that. Sorry, a part of the conversation that we'll have with our colleagues at the city as well. Okay. Uh, I mean, I get it. I mean, I guess I just share some of my colleagues' frustration is that we're, we're not being able to be more strategic and thoughtful and thinking long term. Uh, well, I appreciate the short term. So, I mean, it's kind of a circular conversation, but thank you. I appreciate it. The other thing and I, I, oh, go ahead. I have some additional task yeah. site questions as long as we're on that topic. And I, I, I will say that I share Commissioner Stegman's concern about this being an ongoing investment. I mean, I, you know, I, I think there's no, well, I wouldn't say there's no way. If the thought is that there's a possibility of funding them, setting them up, and then shutting them down next year, that seems extremely unlikely and unwise. So essentially by doing this, I think we're committing to a long-term investment and I, I have some questions about that. But more specifically about the task sites. Um, so at $16 million for 200 beds, that's $80,000 per bed per year, right? And I, uh, that's, that's very high. Um, and I, I would like to know what kind of analysis has been done into the costs and effectiveness of this form of sheltering strategy as opposed to others. I, I support a sheltering strategy. Yes. I want to be clear about that. But I have real questions about $80,000 per bed for these sites. So I'd, I'd like to know what that analysis is. And then what specifically is included in the operations of this? Is this, is this just for the urban alchemy piece? Is it for operations as well as supportive services? So, so more detail around that. I, I'll stop if, if you want to answer now or or uh, you can get back to us. So I, I'm happy to pass along and, and our colleagues from the city were here uh, a month or two back to talk about time, place, and manner and the task sites. So I'm happy to get some of these specific questions um, directly over <laughs> to them and we can provide a joint response to, to these questions and whatever else might come up. I mean, I think it, for us is the analysis of this as opposed to other options. And I'll mention that someone this morning, I think, um, Somebody mentioned that recovery housing costs by way of comparison are $26,000 per year. So that's the kind of analysis yes. that I'm expecting that we've done before we make, before we make this investment. Um, another question, this may be for the city. Um, as I understand it, they've already approved a five-year $50 million contract with Urban Alchemy. So I am wondering what our investment goes towards if they've already approved those operating costs. Can I can I ask what just as a just to because we literally have 20 minutes left for four of us to be making points and asking questions which we can acknowledge is not nearly enough time um, can we just like acknowledge we all have major questions about the TAS investment and maybe can submit those um, so that we're not just going to spend the 20 minutes focused on the TAS and asking questions. That's fine. Yeah, and I would, um, sorry, um, I would say that, yes, one of the things that I was going to say in my closing comments is that we are going to take all of the questions today and, um, and you know, kind of send them to the right department or to the right jurisdiction to, to answer. So if folks have things that they want to submit in writing um, to Stacy, and then we'll make sure that we get those answers in, in time for the, um, our discussion next week on this. I, I think that's a great suggestion as to the specifics. I do think that the overall analysis question is is a broader one yes. you know and i'll say that these these specific questions relate to one of my biggest concerns about the package um, which relate to the size of the investment in the task sites as a specific sheltering strategy um, the size of the investment in sheltering as relative to transitional housing, recovery housing, which is so much of what we heard about this morning. I had originally proposed 20 million to go to that sort of strategy. And this strategy is so heavily weighted I'm towards emergency sure. shelter. So with, I have other overarching questions, um, including the ongoing piece, but those are my broader questions about this piece of the package. 
And toward that, I'd like to just put out there um, in response to Commissioner Brim Edwards' question about some big picture items. Um, I have a lot of comments I hope to make at some point, but um, to drill it down, uh, I think that we can do some things useful by investing in a few linchpins we know are crucial to life, safety, and health in our community. I have three things. First and foremost, I believe we need to save lives. I've been saying this for a long time, and people continue to die on our streets. We need to address the public health and safety crisis, and I believe that that is by shelter expansion, but not just one-offs or more mass encampments without the additional information. Um, we need a plan, an ecosystem of shelter options to meet a wide range of needs that can be scaled up quickly and hopefully much less expensively than $20 million for a couple of TAS sites for a year. And so I propose $12.5 million to be used for both shelter beds and to build effective systems. For systems, I propose creating a collaborative security plan so what around shelter sites, so what happens, say, with the BHRC and other shelters in our community and our neighborhoods does not happen again. I propose developing shared coordinated in-reach plans so we have a system to intensively go to different shelters instead of expensively and inefficiently providing all services at all shelters all the time for our alternative shelters. And finally, I support Commissioner Brim Edwards in her proposal for a data system that tracks shelter availability in real time and can get people shelter where they need it, when they need it. For specific shelters, and we can talk about these, I'm gonna include Bybee Lakes, an Afro Village in collaboration with Grow, Play, Learn in East County, Barbie's Village, a Native American healing village, and day centers and community hubs, including Blanche House, Sisters of the Road, and in East Portland, the collaborative with our partners who testified here today, um, Cultivate Initiatives, Ray Hub Sisters, PDX Saints Love, to create what people need. So the first is health and safety, so it is public health. In addition to that, to improve public and individual safety at the intersection of homelessness and behavioral health, I propose investing in a sobering center, an actual facility where people can be when their intoxication impacts their and others' safety. It's not detox, it is people use these, it confuse them understandably, but they're not the same. People, sobering is where people who are intoxicated by drugs or alcohol can go to, to be until they are ready to leave. It's a public safety need, this is not a public health need at this point, but it can grow into one to what the beacon process initially envisioned with transition, triage, stabilization, and referral. And so my, the third part of this, which is the key to all of it, I believe, and what we heard literally from everyone who testified today, and what I've experienced being in the um, provider community and working with people over decades is the one thing that can change the revolving door from streets to jails to ERs to heal into a one-way door, an entrance to healing recovery is recovery-based, long-term supportive housing, and tra so transitional housing for thousands of people and for our community. So the Crown Plaza is where I'm continuing to propose $25 million. This is a bargain compared to, say, the $20 million proposed for investing in one year of operations for an encampment shelter system. Um, the seismic upgrade, like huge amount of investment needed has been debunked. Um, there has been information from facilities working with a city builder and um, we need to be opportunistic in the best sense of the word. This is adjacent to unity, we can do IOP, the intensive outpatient treatment, we can do partial hospitalization, it's where it needs to be. Andy Mendenhall from Central City Concern support, supports this. Tony Morse from Oregon Recovers has sent a letter of endorsement. There are many, many more. And I just have to speak to the fact that I too find it unusual that, that you propose putting the $20 million into this one year of the encampments ver 
and only a very tiny amount into recovery, housing, detox, all these other things combined. And the statement in your proposal felt to me like a physical blow when I read it. And I'm not gonna read the paragraph, but you said from ERs, some other stakeholders who I work with and know well, the common message is that they're all relatively able to address behavioral health crisis needs but lacked clear and immediate pathways for consumers to exit to a bunch of buzzwords. Um, and I've worked alongside all the stakeholders. I am one of them. Anyone working in the field or just walking on our streets understands how profoundly uninformed this statement is, and it's not aligned with the reality. Behavior so, so, so let me respond, because that was, it was literally relatively. I mean, that, I, you know, in talking to so ERs um, are partners. relatively able to handle heart attacks. That's so what it's like saying. In, in conversations with, with Legacy, with Providence, it's like they, they will disagree. To have, these are conversations that I have directly had with these I know, people. and I think you've misunderstood them. No, I haven't, and, and that is your opinion, and I have had many, many conversations with people um, both you know, in meetings and, and offline and, um, and the things. So, we, are, we know that there are gaps throughout the system. We know that there is significant need across the board. And as we're building the system, it's about the next best investments. We're not saying that there isn't a need for um, people to get into more stabilization. I was with Commissioner Stegman when we went, um, when we were just at the Hooper Detox Center. And there, you know, as, as she said earlier, there is, there is huge need for there. But as we're talking about what is the next best thing, again, it was relatively, right? Um, and there have been some investments. So it's how can we grow the next steps on this in the system? And I will say, and, and the system. No, and you, so Commissioner Myron, you, it's a problem. no, it is, it's, so, it's so Commissioner not. Myron, that is okay. your opinion. And I will say, in terms of like the $25 million for, um, for the Crown Plaza, I think you were speaking incorrectly about it because I have had conversations with people you had referred to as being supportive and they don't see a business case for it. So I don't, you know, I haven't I'll, said that. I'll forward you the emails. That, that's fine. I mean, because that would be helpful because honestly, the business case hasn't been proven, and when you when you brought this up the first time at the first meeting, there was there was a lot of questions from this board, questions that I think still remain unanswered about what does it look like in terms of a purchase price of, of $55 million or $50 million that we only have $25 million for here. Where are the other partners? Who else is coming in? I don't know that those questions have been answered. So you continue to push this, and there continues to be unanswered questions. So. And, and you and it is your right to, to put forward your proposals and everything, but it is also you know incumbent upon us when we're asking to vote on things to answer tougher questions. That's like questions that have been raised up by the task sites. Like we need to get those questions answered so this board can make an informed um, decision. So I just I would just say just use the same discipline for the ideas that you're bringing forward as 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 we have for all of the other ones that are out there. You, I have provided answers. I will continue to provide provide answers to the questions. And it is really, dis it's disheartening to hear um, how you describe the answers to questions that are provided. The thing, like we just got your proposal, what, the, the night of Tuesday, I didn't even see it till yesterday morning, and then it's out there. That is not a way to have these conversations. And if we're saying we're having work sessions, 20 minutes is not time to be able to speak to and respond to the questions that are raised. And I can absolutely respond to all of them. But there, there's just not time here. So you're putting all of us in a very awkward position of sitting here having this conversation. I, I'm all about public conversation. I would have just said, okay, hour and a half, we're just gonna do it. It's the first thing we do and we're gonna get through it not gonna have a presentation, we're gonna have the board discussion, that would be an approach I would take so that we can all have interaction. But I will, I will stop Chair, if, if I could offer, I feel like, um, number one, I think it's important for each of us to detach emotionally from a specific location, from, because I think we have to look at the larger picture of are we meeting 
the spirit and the requirements that are listed in the LIP. And moreover, like this group has not, we have not determined a process. And so I think that's of you how, a good one. how, well, I, I've tried, is not tried to lay it. the groundwork, but until we as a group figure out what is the process to determine our priorities, I think we're gonna be talking in circles. Yeah, and so I, I, I think before we talk about the individual items, we have to agree what that process is. And I don't know what it is yet, but I, I think that we have to figure that out because right now there's no guardrails. We are just like all over the place. And you know, I was looking, you know, it speaks to the larger strategy of, you know, there's the US Interagency Council on Homelessness. They have an all in the federal strategic plan to prevent and, hold, and end homelessness by 25%. So again, it goes back to, you know, we, we hire consultants for, uh, you know, like the Transforming Justice, which is an amazing uh, strategic plan. And I would put forth, again, this is outside of just this conversation, is that we need a county-wide strategy about how to address homelessness, uh, and create more <laughs> behavioral health. And I've yeah, I, I know. Six and a half years. I, Commissioner Meyer, I, I understand that, you know, but, and I appreciate that, but, and, you know, I know you've pushed for that, but that doesn't mean that other people haven't seen the same thing as well. So, I mean, we can complain about the past all we want. We're here today. We have to accept where we are. We have to move forward and do the best we can. Exactly. So, but, we, but right now, like, we've got to figure out the process, and we've got it. Let, that's like the task. Like, I mean, I'm not. I mean, there's a philosophical ideology. Are we going to continue to invest in just sheltering people in low barrier? Maybe we are, or are we going to listen to people who come from the tr recovery community that says we need more treatment beds? I mean, and it, it, finding that balance is really hard. But I think we're at. A, I think we're at a tipping point where we, we've got to change things uh, the way that we're doing. And right now, there's no guidelines. So I don't know what the answer is. We, I mean, I feel like we need somebody to come in and help design what that process, transforming justice was a really good process. So I want to recognize um, Commissioner Brim Edwards because I know that she has had a lot, uh, she had wanted to say something. I will say though, in terms of the process. So, I mean, this this kind of is the process, right? Like we have not done this as a board before. We, I think in past budgets, we've had like the chiefs of staff go into a room and like figure stuff out. So this is a different, this is a different way of doing things. And we can talk about, again, it's not going to be happening next week, but we can talk about what that final vote looks like. Do we want to vote on a package? Do we want to vote on individual investments, right? Again, this proposal today is a framework to try to think of things in terms of the big buckets that align with the, the work that's currently going on in the joint office, the needs that we've heard from community around behavioral health investments and others. Um, but we, I mean, but this is where we can talk about it. Like it, it's, it would be interesting to me to hear what does the board actually feel comfortable doing in, in terms of the approach for that. So I just wanted to add that by Commissioner Brim Edwards, go ahead. So I have some comments, but I first want to just react to what you said. I, um, it's messy um, having discussions about big issues in public. And I really respect that we've, you are moving the conversation and the discussions out of the chief of staff and the board staff, which are private discussions that are not open to the public, into a public forum. I think that's really important because um, we have a huge amount of money, the stakes are very high, and people need to understand our decision making, what information we have, what information we don't have. So I, I, like I say, it's messy, but I think this is the appropriate place for us to have these discussions versus all of a sudden we appear at the dais and we have you know, five zero votes or we have split votes and everybody's like, how did that, how did that happen? What information were they basing it on? So I'm um, really thank, thank you. And I, it's an ongoing, pro an iterative process on finding something that, that works in a, in a public body. Uh, so just to my comments, um, First, I want to say that I'm very supportive of the creation of more shelter beds of all types to decrease the need and the amount of unsanctioned camping and to provide basic services and stability and safety for those who are living on the streets without service and dying at record rates um, that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, I have a question about the proposals on the table because it looks like it's actually 315 new shelter beds and 175 in stabilization. So just, it, you know, to answer now, I've put the question in, but. Um, I had a proposal for 600 um, 
plus new shelter beds using a whole variety, not just the task sites, but like the mini villages, safe rest, a um, whole host of different varieties. Um, but I think that's a very critical first step. Again, um, we've seen um, record numbers of people um, dying on the street um, who are homeless, um, a domicile unknown report, and I think shelter takes um, a first step of helping people. It also addresses you know, some really significant impacts in our community. Um, I'm also focused and want to support the expansion of day center services. Um, they're providing critical services in our community, and I would just um, look also at places where there's um, high, currently high usage and high demand, Blanche House, Rose Haven, down ha down, uh, downtown that need our support, um, and how we incentivize more day center creation. Um, I do want to say at the last meeting, I. Um, said I was planning on offer amendment and I held off because we were gonna get the impact report um, that staff had, had this, has been preparing on what this, the city's time, place, and manner uh, report, um, their, the time, place, and manner camping restrictions and the shift from people not camping during the day um, and how that's gonna impact um, our community and a lot of our public, um, our public facilities like our libraries and I um, would be very hesitant to make just a, I'm pleased that the amount is similar to the amount I had before it, and I know it's important, but I think we really need to have that report, which I was hoping we'd have it today, to be able to inform our thinking about what's needed. Um, I am concerned that if we're changing the mission of the libraries, for example, um, that instead of being having their traditional mission, that they have some other like day center um, focus, which I, my, my preference would be that we look at our public spaces and how do we adjust to the uh, city's implementation of the camping restrictions in ways in which our public spaces like libraries, parks, or thing, other places are still public spaces and that we're providing services in places that are um, designated and that are funded and the resources are there. Um, so I want definitely want to see that report before I could make any sort of decisions. Um, and then uh, the conceptual idea for the $10 million investment in so sobering services. I'm very supportive generally of so sobering services, but I believe it needs to be a center. I've heard over and over again from uh, frontline responders, whether it's firefighters, the police, other people who are uh, Portland Street response, um, healthcare professionals, that having a 24 seven drop off sobering center is critical to our larger ecosystem. So as we have these conversations, I would hope we move from the concept of just generally services that seems diffuse um, to a center. Um, but I really ap applaud the uh, amount of money and that general focus, but again, maybe an opportunity over the next couple of weeks to, to refocus, uh, to focus that more in on that. And then um, I'm gonna say I'm appreciative that there is um, a um, East Portland, East County dedicated employee. I think um, Commissioner Stegman and I have um, called out the um, amount of, um, the need in East Portland and East County for um, more supports. Um, I would say that I'm interested, I, I think one FTE is not at all adequate. Um, it, I think I look at it more as a foundation. I don't want to say it's inadequate, it's a foundation. Because um, I look at the multi-use path along um, I-205, the Spring Road Corridor Trail, and all the natural areas in East Portland, and there's an unprecedented level of unsanctioned camping um, where the homeless are living without basic services. Uh, wetlands, forests, floodplains in East Portland are heavily impacted by unsanctioned camping. If you just look at the, the map of where the camping is happening, and those are all people without services. Um, we've got the West Lentz floodplain, Foster floodplain, Beggar Ticks wildlife refuge, and the Brookside wetland. And I'd like to see where the county's plan and strategy is to really ad address that versus um, there's a lot of focus on downtown and old town. Um, I'm concerned that the solution is things move east. And so mm -hmm. um, I really wanna make sure that we have a, a stra very specific strategy. Um, like again, you look at the data. Can I just yeah. finish please? Yep. Um, and then I also wanna just um, call out my, my last big priority is cap one-time capital dollars, and I'm a little bit confused about the conversation about eviction assistance and rent assistance when I, I thought this was primarily gonna be a conversation about capital investments. So 
Um, the two other capital investments I'd called out, again, a $25 million investment in recovery and stabilization housing, uh, which we definitely heard this morning the need for that. And then also, um, and I, I don't want to just differentiate, because um, I think in this proposal it's talking about recovery housing vouchers, which are, are very different. What I heard is a key element for recovery is the community that's and supports that are engaged. And I would just want to see a, a lot more information about how a voucher system would provide that that community and the, and the supports. Um, because what I've heard and what I know is that it's recovery housing versus vouchers and sending them off into a variety of places. And this is the last thing I, I, I want to, and, and also there's the Unite Oregon Hope Center for um, Family Housing, Affordable Housing in East Portland. I, I want to, there's one big issue that I have a question about, and I'm gonna need a lot more information because we already put more than $80 million into rent assistance in the 2024 budget, which is very sig significant. Um, I've asked a lot of questions and I haven't got a lot of answers. One of the answer questions I had was how much of, for example, the housing model now, it's a, um, that was in the corrective action plan. It was $10 million and I looked at the number of people served and it actually worked out to $26,000 per person. And when I asked the question like, is that, are we actually giving somebody $26,000 in rent? The answer was no, it's 13,000. So if it's 13,000, which is half the amount is actually going to rent assistance, my question is, where is the rest of the, the funding going? Is it support, is it administrative as it goes from Metro to the county, to the joint office to um, Home yeah, Forward so to- 39 so we'll, we'll, just, so, let, me, let me just yeah. finish, because um, I would like for us to have, um, and for the board to have the auditors look at that to really provide some clarity. I think there's been a lot of questions about um, like, is, is it preventative rent assistance? Is it long-term? How is this gonna be sustainable with a short, with a you know, relatively short-term tax if we're providing permanent rent assistance? Um, but I, I look at this and if half the 80 million is going to something other than rent assistance, I've just questioned the effectiveness and wanna make sure that those dollars, which we know is a, is a, is a strategy, but that those dollars are spent effectively and, and well and actually provide a lot more benefit than half the money going somewhere else. Um, and they're precious dollars. So and Julia, I'm gonna, um, I'm sorry, Commissioner Burm Edwards, I'm gonna, we're over okay. time and I wanna- Thank you for allowing me to yeah. share my concerns yeah. and I look forward to the process. Yeah, and we will, and we'll get some more, I think there is updated information that's coming in terms of the actual cost of rent um, for the rental assistance that is being proposed as well as the cost of the permanent supportive housing, the supportive pieces of the permanent supportive housing, that, and we'll, we'll be able to get that as soon as possible. I think that um, I was actually asking that question yesterday and um, it was coming up. So I wanna open it up for last comments for folks. Um, if we, I mean, you, yeah. I, I have a lot of. I, I know you haven't you haven't talked a lot yet today, so I wanted to. So, open you know, it. I don't want to squeeze them into one minute. Yeah, um, yeah. I will assume that we have yeah. more time to make comments, and uh, I have some specific questions that I can provide in writing. But there are larger questions that I think need to be discussed and not just mm -hmm. provided in writing. Yeah, and so so I will ask everyone to send the questions that you have. Um, on specific things, things that you know, are not like discussion questions, but specific investments or questions, especially if there's information that we can then um, forward to, like for instance, the city of Portland or an organization or uh, to the departments. So we'll get those um, and we'll, ha we'll can continue this conversation next Thursday. Can we post those somewhere on our website when the board, when we raise questions, I mean, they're ones I would want to raise in public so that there's transparency around this and it communicates with the public. Um, and we end up having to provide them in a written form, but they're the same questions. Is there a way to post those maybe on the joint office website or the county website so the public gets the answers as well? So I think what we can do is um, when we have the, the answers, we could post that into the, um, like for the work session, for instance, next week, we could post those as one of the, um, the items, you know, like one of the resources for the, the item okay. that we'll have on the, um, be on the board meeting next week. That's the easiest way to do that. Just a question, is there a reason why we can't listen? I mean, is that we have to end at 12.30 that we can't yeah. listen to Commissioner Jai Paul's comments? I mean, I, I would be <laughs> interested in hearing them and having it be sorry, top of mind when I'm thinking through next week. 
if if I wanted to be, uh, I will check with Commissioner Stegman because I had I have something that I need to to be at, at one. Well, I I mean I can I can so cut I, down my I, travel time. I think we should just schedule a yeah. long chunk of time. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Rather than yeah, and again, I know I can. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate yeah. it, Commissioner Bermuda Edwards. I, I would rather schedule a longer piece of time, not feel rushed, because there are going to be comments and questions interwoven in what I have to say, and I, I you know, I think that's the better way to do and it. And I would, and I think people need to eat. Like I think, like we've had a lot of. Yeah, I mean, very you know, hangry. I, if right. I don't eat. I, I'm like, I think people need to. Eat. I think we need to recognize, like people need to take care of themselves as humans. I have my um, Swedish fish dash. And I and I know Commissioner <laughs> Stegman had something that. Over well, I've already canceled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, so, I can stay for another hour, but uh, uh, but Chair, I am very concerned about the time. I think that the thinking that we're going to vote or that I'm going to be ready to vote next Thursday. No, no, I already said we are. We're not, not voting. We are not voting. We're just going to use all that time, which was already, I think, scheduled for an hour for discussion. So we'll just extend that. Okay, um, and I would really appreciate some extended uh, briefings um, with, with Stacy, who's been great, and with Dan Field. Uh, you know, I mean. It goes beyond asking, you know, discrete questions. It's like, help me understand how how did you get like why are you doing this instead of this? So, uh, I mean, if we could schedule some longer briefings with staff, that would be really beneficial for me. Of course, I know Stacy made herself available yesterday, and she will yeah. continue to do that as well as Dan and the folks from the Joint Office. Right. And also bringing East County, um, our East County electeds, into the conversation because I I'd heard that they weren't. Um, necessarily that what we're proposing it's great to be thinking about East County and East Portland but I'm not sure what is proposed is what I think they have some ideas as well that would be great to incorporate as we're looking at their uh, well, what to do with that. I will let you know that East County I have a monthly meeting with their city managers so they are I'm informed. talking about the electeds yeah well they they work for the elected so but anyway happy to have uh, that yeah, and, and I've had conversations, and I was actually in East County all yesterday meeting with elected officials. So they, they, there's a lot. There's been a lot of conversation. So I appreciate that. Okay, with that, thank you everyone, and we will reconvene on Tuesday for a board briefing. And with this, we're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>